Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope this episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you like it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel, and that way you'll never miss a thing. Well, if you're like me, you're always looking for ways to stay informed and engaged with the world around us. And that's why I created On The Rise. It's a curated weekly newsletter packed with thought-provoking articles and insights on faith, culture, and the future of the church and really any other subject that I find fascinating and conversation worthy. And I send it to you absolutely free every single week. So if you're ready to join the conversation and be part of a community of curious, engaged leaders, you can subscribe to On The Rise today at ontherisenewsletter.com. You can start and stop at any point on theRiseNewsletter.com. This episode is also presented by Glue. Glue is connecting the faith ecosystem in innovative ways. One way is by making it a lot easier for churches to connect with new visitors. Did you know, for example, that the time it takes for a church to respond to new visitors has a major impact on whether that new person or family will stay? Well, with Glue, you can use automation to build engaging new visitor engagement journeys. You can learn how at get.glue.us slash visitors. That's get.glue.us slash visitors. And now to today's episode. What would you say the spiritual temperature of New York was when you arrived? Well, it, it was very vital in the boroughs mm. because for about um, 30 years were all these new churches getting started, in, uh, but from non-Western missionaries. So that, in other words, the people who were starting churches were from Africa, Latin America, Asia, and they were planting hundreds and hundreds of churches. That was from probably around 1970 to about the year 2000 or so. When I got here, just starting the 90s, Manhattan was very, very um, uh, secular, but the rest Ooh. of the city was not. So if you went to a community board meeting <coughs> in uh, the Bronx, for example, it might be open in prayer wow. because most of, the, uh, most of the civic leaders were black and Hispanic Pentecostal ministers. And if you went to Brooklyn, you might, it, might, uh, it would be filled with Orthodox Jews. And if you went out to Queens, the uh, community boards would be filled with uh, Asian Christians. But in, in, a, in Manhattan was secular, and mm. the, the churches were extremely small or dying. And so when I got here, the, the spiritual growth that had been happening in the rest of the city hadn't really reached the center. But it changed that since then. I've heard a more. stat, it may or may not be accurate, that something like less than 1% of Manhattan was attending an evangelical yeah, church when yeah. you arrived. Is right. That we, well, we, we define center city as from the top of, Man the top of Central Park. Okay. Um, south to the, to the tip, plus a little bit of Brooklyn, a little bit of Queens, in other words, the very near environs. That we would call that center city, right. cosmopolitan, very wealthy, professional. There's about a million, one million fifty thousand people that live in that area. And from what we can tell in 1989, there are only 9,000 Manhattan residents going to wow. evangelical churches out of wow. that one million in 1989. And by 2014, there were about 54,000. So that was a kind of <coughs> growth of about- Quintupled. Yeah, yeah, in about, in about uh, 25 years. Wow. So that's been the biggest change. Let's have a seat. Okay. Yeah. There we are. Um, so let's drill down a little bit further, Tim. Uh, when you look back on the last 10 years when it comes to the church in America, so just think about the last decade, what do you see changing? And let's start with things that you can celebrate. You're like, this is very encouraging. We went there a little bit with the growth of the church in Manhattan, but just think about the church in America or the church in the West. What have been some bright spots in the last decade? Well, I wouldn't say there's, there's not a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, oh, let's put it this way. Certainly there are a lot, but I mean, th there's probably more, more cons there's more areas of concern than there are bright spots, sure. honestly. But bright spots, I think, is the growth of new multi-ethnic churches, by mm. and large. There's a lot more of those. Um, I do think that the, um, the future of Western society and Western culture is multi-ethnic. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons why that's true. I'm not, uh, I'm not so much celebrating it or denigrating it at all. I'm just saying that the 
percentage of white people in the West and in the world will be smaller and smaller. Um, there will be more, uh, mul there'll be more multiracial marriages, there'll be more multi-ethnic communities and cities. That's still not true for parts of the heartland like, you know, Iowa and New Hampshire are still 90% white and so on. But by and large, that's changing and the church is changing there too. That there really are more efforts to create multiracial churches. There are, uh, especially in cities, there's more of them. And I think that's, to me, maybe the biggest bright spot because that's keeping up with the changes. What are some of the challenges you see over the last decade? Well, I just see exactly what Re Leslie Newbigin saw, and that's, so this is nothing but, don't give me any credit for this at all. I'm just channeling him. <clears throat> he would say that for a thousand years, the Western Church assumed a mission model in which most people in a culture would feel some social pressure or at least see some social benefits going to church. Yeah. And... Um, the culture created people that had, a, had the basic furniture uh, for a Christian worldview. That is, they usually believed in a personal God. They often believed in an afterlife, heaven and hell. Uh, they believed that they should be good and they weren't perfect and that therefore they, they, you know, they did need forgiveness. So uh, you could call those the religious dots. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> belief in God, belief in an afterlife, belief in the moral law, belief in sin. And so these are the church could assume that people would be, would just show up in church if they were invited, or they would show up in church maybe at Easter and Christmas, or maybe for weddings and funerals, and they would, if they came, they would have a general respect for the Bible, and they would have some basic understanding of these things. And evangelism was just waiting for people to show up and then connecting the dots. <laughs> but what do you do if people don't come to church, won't come to church, why should they, and don't have the dots? So you can't evangelize by saying, oh, you want to go to heaven when you die, right? And you know you're not perfect, but Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you can be sure, if you believe in him, that when you die, you'll go to heaven. So that's assuming all the dots. And what if the dots aren't there? Now what do we do? Hmm. And Newbigin's basically saying that the entire Western church for a thousand years has assumed a Christendom culture. And now that it's gone, it has no way of reaching people, doesn't know how to talk to people, get their attention. It doesn't know how... Even if they do show up, it, they don't know how to share the gospel in a way that makes sense to them. So, is that a cause for concern? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And th that's why I say, that to me, that is, that is an overshadowing <clears throat> concern. Yeah. How do you see that show up in the model of church that you see in America today? What do you think? You think a lot of evangelicalism or even mainline evangelicalism is still waiting for people to show up yes. and connect the dots? Yes, and uh, now the Willow Creek uh, seeker model yeah. w did take one step in the direction of saying people aren't going to come to church unless they're great production values. Mm. Uh, so they, they don't feel the same social pressure to go to church. But even that seeker service model kind of assumes that people would see a social benefit right and that they have somewhat a, tra a somewhat of a traditional mindset that they would say church is good and it's good to be talking about these moral issues and it's good to be talking about how do you handle anxiety i would still say that they are assuming a kind of a, um, a still a fairly traditional kind of person that would come in the door. They're not looking at people, I don't think they're reaching people who feel like the church is an agent for injustice. I don't think they know what to do with people who say, you can't make me feel guilty because um, uh, the meaning of life is not to be good, a good person. See, that's what my, my family, my parents' generation, whether they're Christians or not. Yeah. The meaning of life is to be good. Today, the meaning of life is to be true to yourself. Mm. And that's I, I just don't think that our church today has any way of dealing with that. We, and they, they certainly don't know how to, answer, how to answer somebody who says, I'm just being true to myself. So when you look at your ministry at Redeemer, how did you respond to that? How did you attempt to say, okay, we're going to turn the dial on that a little bit differently? Well, the 30 years ago, it, there wasn't yet that... Inf <clears throat> the emphasis on being true to yourself and, and creating yourself. You might say yeah. that when I came along... My parents' generation, whether they're Christians or not, believed the meaning of life was to be good. Yeah. And the way you preached to them was to 
deal with their guilt <laughs> and say, you're never going to overcome your guilt with uh, moral effort. You're going to have to get forgiveness from Jesus. So it, that sort of thing is what you did. By the time I came along to New York, and New York was a little more, it was further advanced than the rest of the country. Went right. Toward more Bit secularism. Of a canary in a coal yeah, mine. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when I got here, the meaning of life was to be free to discover your true self. Uh, that's very Rousseau. Jean, yeah, that, that's very much like what Rousseau would say, which is society kind of screws you up, but in your, there's an inner child in there, a kind of perfect inner being, and um, the world makes you feel very guilty about it, and you just need to be free to discover who you really are and, and uh, express that without guilt. That was very Freudian. Hmm. Uh, it was very psychological. When I got here, all the talk was about um, dysfunctional families and enabling behavior and getting free from people making you feel guilty. Right. So it was actually, that's the reason why, if you just preach why, if, if you assume people are guilty and then they know they ought to be guilty and then you give them the relief through Jesus, you try to do that with the people that were in front of me in New York, they would have just walked out the door. They said, that's what I don't need. I don't need that. And so the way the gospel worked with um, my parents' generation was, you know you should be good, but you're not as good as you would like to be. But Jesus Christ can forgive you, and in him you can be accepted by God. With my young people that I came to here in New York, basically I said, you think the meaning of life is to be free, but you're actually not as free as you think you are. You have to live for something. Everybody has to live for something, and whatever that thing is you're living for will enslave you. And you will feel guilty and shameful because you'll never feel like you can live up to it. So let's just say, well, I've left my little Bible-believing church back in Hot Coffee, Mississippi, and I've moved up here to be an actress or to be an actor or to make it on Wall Street. Well, guess what? You've got a new God. Hmm. You've got a new master. And when you say, I'm going to be free to discover the, my true self, now you're going to have to live up to that. And you're actually still a slave. You'll be a slave to your work. You'll be a slave to your, you know, your, your figure. You've got to keep your weight down. You'll be a slave. You think you're free, but you're not. Because if you're living for anything but God, you're uh, a slave. And Jesus Christ is the only master who, if you get him, will satisfy you. And if you fail him, can forgive you. Your career can't die for your sins. And so that's how I did it with them, and it, it was okay. In other words, I assumed their cultural narrative and showed how only in Christ could their, you might say, their, their storyline have a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Just like I did that with my parents' generation. Today, it actually has changed again because there's not that same feeling like I just need to be free to find my inner child of the past. Uh, inner child of the past. Now, the emphasis is not psychological, it's sociological. It's all about justice. It's all about uh, creating your own self. If I say I'm this, that's who I am. I can do right. that. And it's all about uh, including marginalized peoples, uh, marginalized identities. And it actually would, it, this, the change was happening just as I was stepping out. So literally the and last I, six years. Yeah, in the last five or six years. And therefore, if I was starting a church now, I'd have to, I'd have to retool again. Really? Yeah. What do you think, like just, off the top of your head. But I haven't done it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So you're saying, what would you do? I said, What well, would you do? Um, Even a couple of broad strokes? Yeah, yeah. A couple of broad strokes would be to say um, the um, Christianity gives you the only identity that is, uh, because it's all about identity now. Yeah. You know? okay. Christianity is the only identity that is received and not achieved. Uh, if you say, I can create myself, that's a lot of pressure. Um, if, uh, and you can see it online. You can see people, they come up with an identity and then they just scream at each other if you don't uh, support my identity um, or then you get, be, you get screamed at if you're not true to your identity. You know, say, you say you're this, but you know, you're hurting the rest of us who are like this. And it's, I said, it's, uh, uh, I said, Christianity is the one identity that's received. In other words, the fact is that because of what Jesus Christ did, Jesus Christ is actually a person who um, lost his glory and his power and his privilege and came and died on the cross for us, paid the penalty for our inhumanity to God and to each other, 
In other words, he took the penalty. And because of that, when I believe in him, I can actually know that God loves me unconditionally forever. You know, I'm righteous in Christ. And what that means is the minute I become a Christian, the minute I believe in God, um, God loves me as perfectly as he will love me five billion years from now when I'm perfect. And he loves me that well right now. Now what that means is it's the ups and downs of my performance. And see, all postmodern people say that identity is performative. Mm. They say power is performative. They say, they say identity is, is, is a, it's a role that you play. That's horrible <laughs> pressure. And so we've got an identity that's received, not achieved. That it's not up and down depending on how well I perform. And, and also, this is an identity that doesn't exclude. Because if you have an identity that's based on being an open-minded, justice-oriented person, then you're going to despise the bigots. And one of the reasons mm -hmm. you despise the bigots is a way of you bolstering your kind of flagging sense of self-worth by saying, I'm basically saying, oh Lord, I thank thee I am not as other men, including <laughs> yeah. this tax collector right here. And that's how you bolster a, an insecure identity by excluding other people and looking down at them saying, I must be okay because I'm not like these horrible people over here. With a Christian identity, you don't have to do that. You, you will not do that. In fact, um, in James chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, it's interesting. It says that the rich Christian should think about his low position and the poor Christian should think about his high position. Hmm. Now, what's beautiful about that is the Christian identity says you're a sinner and you would go to hell if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. So it's got the lowest, it, it makes you come all the way down here and say, I can't save myself. So you have a low position, you're a sinner, you deserve nothing but judgment. And yet, in Christ, I am loved more than I dared hope. I'm accepted, uh, Jesus Christ says, the Father loves you even as he loves me. Now what's interesting is if you're a poor person, and look, at, look how brilliant the Christian identity is. If you're a poor person, and um, all of your life you've been told you're nothing, hmm. and you become a Christian, you should dwell on your high position. Dwell on who you are in Jesus Christ, and that will overcome all of the crap you've gotten for so many years from people. Yeah. But what if you're a rich Christian? What if you're a person that you've gone to the right schools and you've gotten all these, all your life people have been telling you how great you are. Whew, you become a Christian, you need, you need to remember your low position. You need to remember that you are a sinner saved by sheer grace, that you are no better than anybody else. What's brilliant about the, the Christian identity is it doesn't exclude people, and it actually, it, it, it's, a, it's an enormous equalizer, and it takes all the pressure off. Now, that's where I would be going. Hmm. I would be saying, I don't care how you guys are forming your identity, there is no identity like the one that you can find in Jesus Christ. So that's not the same quite as 30 years ago where I said there's no freedom like you get in Jesus. And there's, you know, it's not like what I would have preached down in Hopewell, Virginia, which I did in the 1970s when all the people out there were like my parents. Hmm. So you've got to connect the gospel with, the gospel is that Jesus saves you, you don't. Right. And you have to connect it to the, the cultural narrative. So just exegeting the culture. Yeah, but then you, right, but then you've actually got to find a way to take the plot line of the culture and give it a happy ending in Jesus. So, for example, 1 Corinthians 1, the Greek, it says the Jews want power and the Greeks want wisdom, but the cross is weakness to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, but to the Jews and Greeks that are being saved, the true wisdom and true power of God. So what is Paul doing? He says the cultural narrative of the Jews is we want, we're pragmatic, we want to know how you get things done, give me power. The cultural narrative of the Greeks was they're the artists. They're the, you know, we want contemplation. We want wisdom. We want beauty. And what he's saying is the gospel confronts the idolatries of both of those cultures differently, but also fulfills them differently. The cross confronts the uh, idolatry of power and of wisdom, but then it says, but the cross is the true wisdom, the true power of God. In the cross, you actually get, O oh, culture, what you want. <laughs> so it's not just cultural exegesis. It's uh, contradictory contradictive fulfillment. It's subverting it and fulfilling it. And that's what you have to do in every culture. That's basically the missionary, um, that's the missionary task. Hmm. So we live in a disruptive age and the State of the Church report talks about a lot of elements of disruption. What else have you seen disrupted over the last few decades in New York City and in culture? 
Um, well, one of the one of the things, of course, is that the um, the most disruptive thing is that there were always the kind of um, how do I say it? There was always a small number of evangelical and maybe conservative Catholics who were very devout, and they had, you know, Christian. Uh, they were very devoutly Christian, but they also had Christian ethics. So they, mm. you know, they uh, Christian view of morality and sexuality and things like that. Um, that's maybe twenty percent. Then there was eighty percent of the of the population who were nominal Christians. They didn't. I mean, they went to church on Christmas and Easter. You know, they said they were Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic, but they, it wasn't big. It wasn't very deep, and yet they actually held the Christian views too. Mm. And that was I, the reason I'm making these strange gestures is they were like an umbrella. Okay. They were a shelter because to be a, a, an Orthodox evangelical or Catholic and to have all these views of things didn't look that weird because 70, 80 percent of the population had the same view of marriage right. and sexuality and things like that. But when that has gone away, what's going away is inherited religion is dying, not chosen religion, mm. not religion based on conversion but inherited religion where you're born into it, my family's Methodist, I went to church growing up, that's just going away. You know, young people say, uh, unless I choose it, it's not, nobody can choose my right. religion for me. So the idea that you're, you're, you're born into a Catholic family or a Presbyterian family is going away, and that's the reason why the main line and the Catholic Church is just collapsing. And so what you have is these devout people are pretty much the same number of really devout Christians, but now they look really weird. <laughs> And they, in fact, they look dangerous and strange because, you see what I mean, that protective yeah. covering's gone. And that means um, more ostracism, more uh, strangeness, uh, more estrangeness from the culture. That's the big thing that's happening, I think, right now. When you look into the future, is there anything that you can see on the radar that you're like, hey, leaders, pay attention to this? Well, the political polarization, yes, okay, I'll, here's where I, go, where I would go. Um, the political polarization that's happening now is uh, a major challenge for churches because, uh, here's my reading of the Bible. My reading of the Bible says that Christians ought to be sold out for racial justice. Mm -hmm. to all, the, all races are equal, all in the image of God. They should be deeply concerned about the poor and the marginalized. They should be pro-life. And they should believe, at least for Christians, that the sex should only be between a, a man and a woman in marriage. Okay? Now, those four things. That the early church was marked by them. We know that. Hmm. Okay? Um, two of those look very conservative. Two of those look very liberal. And so right now what's happening is since those four things are never combined in any political party, they're hmm. not combined in any, any other institution other than Catholic social teaching and, you know, biblical Christianity. And so what happens is there's enormous pressure, enormous pressure everywhere in the country for churches to major in two of them and get quiet about two of them. Mm -hmm. So in New York, huge pressure for the churches in New York City to talk about racial justice and caring about the poor. Everybody applause, but if you say we're pro-life or we think sex should be only between a man and a woman in marriage, is there people are going to pick at you. Yeah. I would say in the middle of Alabama, <laughs> if an evangelical pastor starts to preach about all four of those things, a lot of the people are going to get nervous about the racial justice and poverty thing and say, that sounds kind of liberal, that sounds kind of like, you know, wait a minute, what are you doing here? And so I don't know anywhere where uh, it seems to me that there's a kind of red evangelicalism and a blue evangelicalism. And almost everywhere I see people like play up two of those and play down two of those. Or even actually stop believing in two of those. Right. And that's because there's this enormous, pre these are package deals. The, the political parties say you can't have them together. You have to, you know, in other words, to be a Democrat or be a Republican, for example, be Fox News or MSNBC, you just can't keep those things together. And yet, and so that is, the, to me, the biggest challenge for Christian leaders. How do you be, um, 
how do you be committed to the, the, the whole range? That's the early church, it's biblical. So, <coughs> so all four of those, Tim, have been, I think, hallmarks of Redeemer, at least to the extent that I've been able to access hundreds of your sermons over the years and your writing and your preaching. How have you held that tension in New York? Well, it hasn't been easy. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there are occasions, I have definitely seen people get up in the middle of sermons and walk out, yeah. which is always a little bit um, satisfying. <laughs> because when you see that, you do say, all right, okay, I'm not a total coward here. <laughs> <laughs> because see, here's the thing. I do think you have to care about context. Yeah. Which means, for example, is you don't want to pat yourself on the bat and say, I'm valiant tr for truth because I'm preaching against abortion every month. Right. Uh, there are certainly people who criticize me for not preaching about abortion constantly. And I do say, all right, look, if, if I have a non-Christian coming to church, I don't want them to get hit over the head with something that I know that they're going to be offended by within the first two weeks they come. So am I going to be careful about my context? Am I going to realize what offends people and what attracts people? Yeah. So I mean, I would say that if I was in Alabama, I'm in the middle of New York City, I wouldn't preach identically. Hmm. I wouldn't be reaching non-Christians the same way. Nevertheless, what you have to do to your leaders constantly, is at least your leaders, you have to say, we cannot get cold feet on any of this. Hmm. I mean, th there is no biblical warrant. I mean, <clears throat> here in Amer you know, here I'd have to say, you all get excited about what the Bible says about justice, and, and, to, and you don't get excited about what the Bible says about sexuality. <clears throat> and at that point, you're really not letting the Bible animate you; you're letting the culture animate you. And um, you know, you've just got to immerse yourself in the Word because they go together. By the way, you know, there's a there's one. I think it's Amos chapter two, verse seven, where it says, "A father and a son go into the same woman." and they sell the poor for a pair of shoes. Mm. So one verse, sexual sin and economic injustice, the Bible sees it as a whole cloth. They go mm. together. And we live in a culture that just tries to rip that apart. So important, for, important safety tip for leaders. <laughs> Tim, at this phase in your life, you've committed the last few years mm. in the future to Redeemer City to City. You came to New York in uh -huh. 1989 why cities and talk about why cities are so important and so strategic. Well, one of the reasons cities are so important for um, the world mission of the church is that they're growing. Hmm. And when Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, he didn't mean go into all the world geographically. He didn't say, go to Antarctica and start churches, <laughs> okay? Even though it's a big part of, you know, geography. Yeah. He meant go to the world demographically. He meant go to where the people are. And uh, the people of the world are moving into cities faster than the church is. Mm. So if we, if we don't spend a lot of, of effort to plant churches in the cities that are growing and growing and growing, then we are actually not obeying the Great Commission. So there's the one answer. A second answer is cities are uniquely difficult places, especially the biggest cities, to plant churches. They're horribly expensive. Um, they are uh, extraordinarily culturally diverse. So you look out there and the people are from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. And you want to know, who am I preaching to? And, and so it's, it's, it's complicated culturally. It's extremely expensive. And for those reasons, we felt at Redeemer City to City that we didn't know of any mission agency that specialized just in urban, in just big, mm. big uh, church planting in global, great big global cities. And since Redeemer had th 30 years of experience, we said, well, there's, let's just leverage that. Uh, we're not saying that everybody's got to go to a city. We're not saying that we only should plant churches in cities. But we're saying is that it's a, a, a huge need demographically. And it's, it's, you can't just pick up and do what you did out in the field, mm. you know, in the suburbs or in the small towns in the city. You have to, you have to it's got peculiar issues. And so why not just leverage our expertise and say, that's what we do. So uh, years ago, City to City was started to say, not that we sne sneer at anybody else, but we just know that city churches need a lot of help. And so we're gonna do that. And so three years ago now, almost three years ago, when I left Redeemer, I stepped full-time into City to City, and that's all we do, is we uh, help national leaders, we don't send Americans, hmm. we help national leaders everywhere in the world reach their biggest global cities, and they have problems. Uh, uh, 
the, the house churches that proliferate all through China have trouble when they go into the big cities because the ministry needs are different. Um, so just because a church is growing in a country doesn't mean it's reaching its biggest city, and that's, that's what we try to do. Mm. And I, I love the point you made in one of your sermons that uh, it was on the book of Jonah, that Jonah was trying to run away from a city, right. and God actually said, no, that's exactly where you should go. When things get bad, God goes into a city. When things get bad, Christians usually leave the city. Yeah, and uh, because, because they're thinking more of their own comfort than they are of usefulness. Mm. Uh, Sometimes people say, well, you've been in New York now. I've lived in New York twice as long as I've lived anywhere else in my life. Mm. And it won't be long before I, I will have lived in New York, if I live long enough, if I live a few more years, I'll live longer in New York than I've lived everywhere else in the <laughs> world. Wow. So people say, well, does it feel like home? Well, even my own children who grew up here, um, my youngest especially, who I don't, who, who t doesn't really remember anything but New York, New York is so unmanageable. I remember the very first day I came here and I talked to a few people who administered in New York. There was a woman who had lived here for years and said, I want you to know that New York City is unmanageable. And what she meant by that is nobody, anybody says this is my town. That's just hubris. Uh, it's the big cities of the world are, are they're, they are too complicated. They are difficult. They are extremely inconvenient. Almost anywhere is more, inco more convenient than living in a great big city. Um, but she says, you want to be here not because you can manage it because it's more comfortable, but because you're so useful here. Hmm. Because there's so many people, there's so much need. Um, so I, you know, what we try to do is we try to give people, Christians who come to these cities, to have a ministry mindset. Don't come just as a teeth gritter who's going to use the city to pad your resume and then go back to wherever you're going to be. Don't use it as a consumer. You say, oh, I just love cities, which means I love the restaurants and I love all the ethos and all that. I say, come here as a minister. Come and love the city. That, that doesn't mean you may, you may not even like the city. Hmm. But loving the city means caring about the people of the city, caring about the infrastructure, caring about the schools, caring about the neighborhoods. You know, come and love the city. And if you were going to be here for two years, make it four. If you're going to be here for five years, make it ten. Uh, or even consider just living here. So that's the attitude. Not like, oh, you've got to be here. You know. No, you just, you just try to give people a ministry mindset. Um, and I think it will bear a lot of fruit because cities, uh, as cities go, so goes the cultures. So I know you're committed to human flourishing and the State of the Church Report has an awful lot to say about it. I and that. Um, <laughs> so uh, I want to share five categories with you of human flourishing. Yeah. This is some of Barna's research that David Kinneman has done. It's Harvard and biblical concepts of spiritual formation. And as I share them, I'd just like you to kind of riff on it. Just mm -hmm. talk about what that means to you, why it's important to the church mm -hmm. in your view. But we'll start with relationship. And the definition in the report is how biblical community and relational, relational health impact human flourishing. So right. just can relationships. Me, give me all five. Okay, so relationships, spiritual health, fiscal and material stability, vocation and career, and wellness and behavioral health. Those are the five components that contribute to um, uh, yeah. human flourishing. I know this could be no. a book. Well, yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that is, um, that's a great list because it really does, it is comprehensive. It is true that as a church, if you're caring about people's flourishing, you really cannot ignore any of those. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt that I think probably um, most churches would say the first two, we're going to talk about that. The last three, not so much. Of course, the one mm -hmm. about giving, yes, as long as it's giving to the yeah. church. <laughs> yeah, fiscal stability, my fiscal stability right. as a church leader. <clears throat> It tends to lose, it, it, most churches, most evangelical churches, um, d they're not very good at talking to them about money in general. They, they, right. they, they talk about give us some money. They certainly, the, the fourth one is not mentioned much at all. I Vocation think. and career. No, because it's, um, I think part of that is because we pastors are not trained on how to help people there. Um, you see, if somebody comes and says, I want you to help me study the Bible and pray, Got it. I've been trained to help you. Let me give you these books. I'll meet with you. But somebody comes in and says, you know, I'm an actor. 
and um, I don't know which parts I should take as a Christian and which parts I shouldn't. And I got some questions about um, certain roles and uh, you know what, what does it mean to be a Christian actor? And I, I'm not you know, as a pastor, I don't yeah. know what to do. And I would say you have to figure that out yourself. I don't know. See, what happens I think when it comes to that one is there's an equality between the pastor, the minister, and the layperson that we don't have in the other areas. Hmm. Um, the um, we don't. I may not know much about acting. He doesn't maybe know as much about the Bible, and we have to sit down and kind of work together. So it's not a matter of him coming and me telling him. Yeah, you're not the expert. Right. And the last one. I actually do feel that we have a tendency to uh, outsource that. <laughs> Wellness and, and behavior. Yeah, health. and yeah. not talk about it and say, go to a psychiatrist or go to a doctor or a medical doctor. I do think that there needs to be better ways for maybe Christians who are medical professionals to, yeah. inside the church, talk to people about it. Um, all that stuff, though, is fruit of the Spirit, all five mm. of them. See, <clears throat> here, this is my take on the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, integrity, humility, faithfulness, self-control. So um, love, patience, and kindness is largely about relationships. Joy, peace, and humility is largely about spiritual disciplines. And um, self-control, faithfulness, which is faithfulness, integrity, those things actually have a lot more to do with, with the last three. So, I mean, basically, the fruit of the Spirit covers it. Um, it does. And the fruit of the Spirit are uh, God, s Spirit-created character. And so I do think you can, um, if you went to the fruit of the Spirit and you went to the book of Proverbs, they're all covered. Because Proverbs mm. talks about all yeah, those yeah. five areas. In a way, the, uh, sometimes, there's other places in the New Testament that don't, but if you go to Proverbs, and I, my wife and I did a, devotional, yeah, going spent through the book of Proverbs. In it. Yeah, did Thank you? you? Well, it, pr there's nothing that Proverbs doesn't talk about. Yeah. It talks about every single area of human fl flourishing. So yeah. I would say if you went to Proverbs and you went to the fruit of the Spirit, you basically could preach that. And, and that would be a, I do think that's a great way of mm -hmm. telling people you really can't ignore any of these areas and you've got to make sure that you're honoring Christ in each of the areas. Hmm. Um, it's interesting because you raised it. Hamilton's playing right down the street. I mean, we're right in the heart of New York City, and you picked an actor as an example. How would you approach that? Actor knocks on your door, a redeemer, and says, hey, Tim, what part should I take? What part should I not take? I would, try, I would probably create a little... Was John, I got this idea from John Stott years ago. <clears throat> it would be good to get a couple of the Christian actors, maybe a little more, um, a little more experienced, yeah. both in Christianity and in acting. <laughs> It would probably be good to maybe even get an academic. I mean, there are people who, te I, I, we do have, by the way, people who, who um, used to go to Redeemer have moved to, other, uh, uh, have moved to other colleges and taught acting. I mean, I know one woman who teaches acting at a, at a secular school in New England, um, another guy who teaches acting at a Christian college. And so these are people who've not only done it, but they've actually had to do reflection on it. So he would say, get an academic, get a practitioner, get a theologian, get a pastor, and, and come together and generate questions. And then have a meeting over a period of year, maybe meet every month or every two months, and, um, and work on the questions together. And, that way, and it's kind of egalitarian, because no one person has got all the answers. And have somebody take notes. Um, and it's, it can be... That's I've, a great idea. Yeah, I know. I've done that in other areas. I wish I had more time to do it. Yeah, that's, no, a, that's a really good idea. And I know <coughs> vocation is really important to David as well, David Kinnaman. We mm -hmm. talk about it a lot. <coughs> um, so also in the report, um, Barna asked pastors, what are the top concerns for uh, the church? And these are some of the top findings. Watered down gospel teachings, the culture shift to secularism, poor discipleship, declining attendance, and reaching a younger audience. Kind of touched on a lot of those already in different ways. Um, and we've kind of uh, touched on your top concerns for the church. Anything you want to add to that before we move on? Well, that's an interesting list. Um, watered yeah. down gospel. I do think that what they're getting at there is we may be over adapting to the, um, the identity narrative. The identity narrative is 
you've got to be true to yourself and you've got to feel good about yourself. <clears throat> and it, it's possible that you start to ad adapt the gospel and turn it into something where Jesus just makes you feel good about yourself. Mm. And by the way, what I did there a minute ago or a few minutes yeah. ago about how you would talk about the Christian identity, unless you're careful, it can really sound like Chris, uh, Jesus is here to boost your self-esteem. Right. You, you, what you, <clears throat> you, you have to say that when Christ's love becomes your identity, it reorders all your loves, mm. which means, uh, this is, that's, August, that's Augustine, what he would say is when, when Christ is your supreme love, he's both the support, he's the source of your love, but he's also your supreme love. What that does is it, it, it demotes everything else without, a f it demotes other identities without effacing them, mm. which is another way of saying, if you're Chinese, um, and you become a Christian, you don't stop being, Ch you don't start being anything else, you're still Chinese. But the, your, your greatest pride isn't what Christ, what, who you are in Christ. And therefore what it does is it takes racial pride, it takes vocational pride, it takes those things down a notch. And that has to be said. Otherwise, if you're, if you're not careful, you say you find your, I've, I've seen youth groups where <laughs> people are told, you find your identity in Christ, which means God loves you, even if you're a, you screw up, he just loves you all the time and, and you should feel good about yourself and not hate yourself. And it actually just becomes not a, an understanding of how your whole life is reordered by the gospel. It's more mm -hmm. like, it's like Jesus basically makes you feel better about yourself. As regardless you just, of whether you change, regardless. That's right. Yeah. And that's watered down gospel, which is more of a self-esteemism. Hmm. Um, and um, I, think that's pro I think that's right. And I think that's probably what they're getting at. That's yeah. a concern of mine, too. Sure. Uh, you've done, uh, it's also, uh, Barna has a partnership with Glue. Big Data is really making, uh, um, yeah, yeah, we live in a very different age. You've done some um, work with Barna over the years where you've done studies for your work at Redeemer in yeah, City to City. What is, in your mind, the line between being data-informed and data-driven? Well, the, the German philosopher, not a Christian, by the way, Jürgen Habermas, uh -huh. has, is famous for saying, well, he's famous for more than this, but he, he has said that while science can tell you what you can do and how to do it efficiently, it can never, ever tell you whether you should do it or not. Hmm. In other words, you can't, get a, you can't get an ought out of an is. You can't get an ought out of an is. So science can tell you what is, it can never tell you what it ought to be. And you have to be careful. When I have people saying, well, the data shows that you should do this, the data can't show you what you ought to do. Uh -huh. The data can inform you about what is, and on the basis of what is, I can make decisions, but I make decisions on the basis of my moral values, which I get from the scripture. Hmm. So uh, there, there is a little danger that you say, well, the, you know, it, uh, for example, my church does not have to grow. What do you mean it, by that? It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible your church has to grow. I mean, ordinarily, if people are growing spiritually and they're sharing their faith, the church will grow. Right. But the, uh, that's, a, that's a byproduct. I mean, the church must grow spiritually. The church must grow in joy. It must grow in worship. Uh, uh, it must grow in those things. And if it's going to grow numerically, then it ought to be a byproduct of that. And therefore, I don't want to just do something that kind of doesn't end run around those things and just gets more people in the door. Right. And sometimes data can look like it's saying, well, if, this, if you do this, you will grow. That's, so anyway, I would say the data can tell me what is, but it can't tell me what I ought to do. <laughs> and if it looks like it is, then I think it's overstepped its bounds. Anything else on the state of the church today? Before we switch gears, I want to talk about preaching. But anything else on what you see, what worries you, what excites you? Um, what confuses me. Okay. Okay, you didn't ask that, but... Well, what, let's do what, that. What confuses me is I'm not sure how hostile the culture will get. Hmm. So should we assume that all the evangelical uh, colleges will lose their accreditation, for example? Yeah. Uh, should we assume that um, you know Christian radio stations will lose their FCC licenses because of they would be considered bigoted or you know hateful and that kind of thing? 
I think that's at least possible. In other words, if you, we should not live in fearfulness of that, especially as I've traveled around the world as a speaker in the last few years, and everybody's got it worse than we do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the, everybody's yeah. got it worse than we do. Yeah. Um, and certainly Americans, I mean, you, you, you're in Canada. I mean, yeah. certainly Americans have it even better than, than well, Christians. Well, it's a little bit tighter where I am. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Nevertheless, I would say that we have to be not afraid of that, but we also should be ready for it. Mm. So we should be not afraid, but ready, and not be shocked if it happens. Do you mourn that? No, not necessarily. I mean, here's the thing. It would be, I, I see, it, to me, it's win-win, believe it or not. The win is, if it doesn't happen, hey, that's great. I mean, mm. there's great advantages to being able to keep your accreditation, your FCC license, and to keep on moving and have your endowment funds. And ins it's, it's better for institution building. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it goes away, it's probably better for us spiritually. It probably is. Even like the whole tax question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, if it goes away, it's better for us spiritually. If it stays, it's better for us institutionally. Would you fight it? Um, oh, I would fight, fight. What do you mean? I mean, what well, I, what like, I, would you, would you, would you petition governments and that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, sure. I'm not sure they'd listen. <laughs> yeah, I'd be very happy to sign a petition for it. Sure. Okay. In other words, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, yeah. I mean, lightly. I L would, lightly, I, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't. No, go to the mat or say this is mm. the end of the world or how can you do this? I mean, most of the other parts of the world, you know, uh, you don't have the uh, the, the ministers. You know, yeah. tax break. You don't have the uh, the nonprofit status. A lot of no, churches. We don't still have, have it. that in Canada, but every time you know I get mail on that, I'm like, well, this feels like the first century more and more all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would not not make it easy, but on the other hand, like I said, it's a win win. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about preaching. Um, what have you learned? And we, again, we've touched on this, but I think you're masterful at communicating to a post Christian culture. And New York has been more post-Christian than a lot of America. And America is becoming very checkerboard. I mean, you yeah. go up the coasts, yeah. it's much more, you go into the cities, it's much more post-Christian. Yeah. I spend a lot of time in the Bible Belt, and there it's generational. You look at Gen Z and millennials, they're very right. post-Christian. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, what's sad about those areas is a lot of times the uh, older people don't realize it's happening. 100%. Yeah. yeah, and so you could go into the very center, for example, if you go to the center of some of these conservative cities, right. if you go to the center of Houston or you go to the center mm -hmm. of you know, these Bible Belt cities, there's, um, the, the younger generation is, is definitely walking away from yeah. faith. They could be in California or New York. That's right, yeah. that's right. And very often the parents aren't as completely aware of it as right. they would be, so yeah. Okay. What would you say to those kids? Well, I think it's, um, I would say that the, the that Christianity has better resources for what they're trying to do. Um, you're looking for freedom, you're looking for meaning, you're looking for satisfaction, you're looking for identity, you're looking for a basis for doing justice. Mm -hmm. you, want a, you want a basis for doing justice that doesn't turn you into an oppressor yourself? Do you want to have an identity that's not performative, that is not exclusive? Do you, I said, I got better resources for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, here's why. I would start there with them, rather than start with what I'd call hard apologetics. Mm -hmm. Here's the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, there's a, there's a, a ponce by Blaise Pascal who said, uh, he says, bring people to the place where they wish Christianity was true, then show them that it's true. Mm -hmm. So there's really no reason for me to get out the guns on the evidence for the resurrection, stuff like that, which is trying to show them that Christianity is true, if they don't want it to be true. Yeah. But if I get them to want it, if, if they get to the place where they say, gee, it would be great if that was true, but is it? Then, then I can do my you know, more traditional So apologetics. speaking to the identity pieces. Would, right, yeah. identity, freedom, meaning, satisfaction, right. justice. You, 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 you speak to the, the, um, the values they have and that they're trying, uh, you have to have an operational way to get those things. You can't live without those things. Well, I think you made the argument, others have made the argument, that in some ways the culture still has the values of Christianity without the faith of Christianity to some especially, extent. Yeah, especially yeah. in the area of morality and justice. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We have a questionnaire that I, uh, in my evangelism class, I ask people to go talk to a non-Christian friend and they have a set of questions uh, to ask them. And um, one of the questions is, how do you determine whether something is right or wrong? 
how do you make a moral judgment? Great and question. all of them, he said, almost all the secular people actually tie, the, tie themselves into pretzels. <laughs> because I said, look, my, the, the, the uh, assignment is not to actually get into a debate. But you can, if you want, ask a, a follow-up question. And the follow-up question there is to say, how do you tell somebody who doesn't feel that what they're doing is wrong and whose culture tells them it's not wrong, that they're doing something wrong? How, how, what, what would you say to them? Um, and they just have no idea because they, they, on the one hand, they're relativists and they say, nobody can tell me what is right or wrong mm -hmm. for me. But then, on the other hand, they want, to do, they want to tell other people not to live unjust lives. And that is deeply incoherent. So that would be one of the things I would be talking to them about. The fact is that they don't have a basis for, they don't have a sufficient moral source for their moral ideals. Hmm. But that would be still not, not the hard apologetics. That's still saying Christianity has better resources for the things you're seeking than you have. And if I got them to the place where they said, oh, that's interesting, um, that'd be, you know, but how do I know this is true? Then I could say, well, let's read the Gospels, let's talk about the claims of Jesus. Then you get into more traditional apologetics. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you've written a lot about apologetics and spoken a lot about apologetics, but I was listening to a talk you gave years ago, and I'm sure you've written about this as well, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you said, the place to start with apologetics is not with hard logic. Like, there are so many codices in the New Testament, et cetera, et cetera. Right, yeah. Because people don't actually respond to logic. They respond right. to emotion. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, what they're Is that accurate? Yeah. And I, okay. I, yes, and I was trying to s say this. They, they've got to want it to be true before they're open to an argument that it is. And they can only want it to be true is if you actually, in a sense, do emotional apologetics. Hmm. There, there's actually a book, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I can't recommend every part of it, okay. but a book by Francis Spufford called Unapologetic. He's a, he's a very cheeky British writer hmm. who is a professing Christian, not a full, and certainly not an evangelical one, not okay. an orthodox one, in, but <clears throat> The subtitle of the book is Why, in spite of everything, Christianity still makes great emotional sense. That's, that's the subtitle. Hmm. And I thought that's pretty brilliant. That's what I was trying to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Is that if for people to think Christianity makes emotional sense, that it gives you a workable approach to identity, or it gives you a, it, it promises a happiness or a love that you find desirable, or it gives you a basis for making moral judgments that, that doesn't turn you into a Pharisee, but at the same time gives you a basis. It says when people start to emotionally want that, because those aren't, that's not hard logic. Hmm. It's more like saying, look, I, I have better resources than you do for the things you're dealing with. So it's part of that pointing out the problem, yes. anticipating the objections. Y yes, I'm trying to show them that Christianity makes emotional sense. And if it makes emotional sense, they'll be open to a argument that it makes rational sense. Can you That's walk what us through to say. an example, just to make it crystal clear? Well, um, y you, know, you might say, um, um, C.S. Lewis, I'll give you an example. C.S. Lewis, when he does his um, argument from desire in his famous chapter in Mere Christianity on Hope, yeah. and what he says is, that he starts off by saying, if you're young, you may not have experienced this, but as you get out in life, you're going to realize that all the things you thought were really going to make you happy don't do it. Hmm. And he does a wonderful job of saying the job you thought would be make you happy, the marriage you thought would make you happy, the, um, um, the, the, the travel you thought would make you happy. At first, it seems like this is finally going to do it, and it, it goes away in the grasping of it. And then he says, I'm not talking about bad marriages. Hmm. I'm not talking about bad jobs. I'm not talking about bad, uh, bad trips. He says, I'm talking about the best possible ones. And you're going to find out that nothing actually satisfies. There's still a kind of emptiness. Um, and then he says, now, once you decide that, there's only two or three possibilities. One is you could say, I just, I need a better wife. I need a better trip. I need a better job. And out there, that happiness is out there in this world. Mm. The second thing you can do, he says, that'll just make you a, an absolutely, uh, he's going to make you driven, it's going to make you anxious. The second thing you can do is say, 
Um, there is no happiness, there is no satisfaction. I just have to harden myself, stop crying after the moon, just get cynical. And he says, well, that might make you less of a nuisance to people, but it also is gonna dehumanize you. It's gonna kill the part of your heart that really wants love and wants happiness and satisfaction. He says, the third possibility is this. He says, ducklings want to swim, there's such a thing as water. Babies want to suck milk, there's such a thing as milk. Desires don't exist unless satisfaction for those desires exists. And if you find in yourself a desire for something that nothing in this world can satisfy, it probably means you were made for another world. Mm. Now, that's logical, and yet it's basically working on emotion. It's yeah. really not. Yeah. It's not the evidence for the resurrection. It's not saying there's the existence of God. It was trying to say there is a, an emptiness in you that you can either say, I'm going to find it in this world, or you can say, I'm going to kill my desire for happiness and then become a real cynic and, and snob. Or you can say, there's actually something else out there. There's another way. Now, if I was preaching this, and I, I do actually preach yeah. this, I would add the Buddhist approach, <clears throat> and the, which, the Eastern approach, which is, which is to say, that the world is an illusion. Hmm. It's a little bit like hardening your heart, but it's, 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 it seems more spiritual. But ultimately, it does make you detach, and I could, make a, I could make a case against it. So what I would do is, I'm actually doing argument, I'm doing apologetics, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's trying to make Christianity make emotional sense. Hmm. And only if it makes emotional sense would people want eventually to sit and listen to an argument why it makes intellectual sense. I don't know whether you would think this has changed a lot, but a lot of people would see a, a surge in the new atheism. Everybody from Sam Harris to Christopher Hitchens to uh, Yuval Harari and people like that who yeah. have written a lot of books. And some of their arguments are fairly strong. Right. You could make the argument that uh, perhaps we're not doing very well on that front as Christians these days with a few, you know, present company accepted. Um, well... Go ahead. So say what you're going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> I cut you off. No, no, no. There, so you're asking me what I that. think of that? Well, I'm saying, what do you think their best arguments are? Oh. That was going to be my question. What well, do you think the best arguments of the new atheists are? I actually think that the, the older new atheists, like uh, Sam Harris and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Hitchens is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the original Dawkins. I think, actually, their stridency has actually uh, faded. Mm. I mean, I, th I think they're, they're, the bl uh, I don't know, they're still it's, striving. It's, it's, it's faded because... It's got a little they're, muddier, they're, you mean? No, no, they're old. And even a Harari, mm. he's, a, he's a more recent one. Yeah. But that's not where kids are. Okay. They, they are, the new atheists are saying science will solve everything. Mm. Um, it's sort of an old uh, enlightenment approach that sort of sees everything rationally. Um, and... Uh, Younger people today are all about justice. Hmm. They're all about identity. And they, I, don't th I actually don't think that that kind of very detached intellectual scientific enlightenment thing that you know, science has got the answers to everything, I don't, I don't think younger people resonate with that. So back to what we talked about earlier. Yeah, I actually, oh, I, wow. think, I don't think that they're in ascendancy anymore. I think hmm. that they're fading. They also do come across as just as fundamentalist and, and narrow-minded as fundamentalist. Oh, yeah, yeah. Harari especially at yeah, the they, end of some of his works. I know. And, but, and yet the books are still selling. Very they're well. Still making, <laughs> they're still well. making a lot of money. Yeah. When I say they're not they in the Senate, it doesn't mean they're not making a good income. Yeah. So. Um, so we got a lot of preachers listening who are like, I think I'm stuck in Christendom. You want to give them some tips on how to move out of that mindset and, I mean, whether that's generational uh, in the Bible Belt or they're in a city and they're not having the impact that they wish they would. What are some starting points for some preachers to oh connect boy. better? Oh, so, boy. Okay, well, yeah. you want the cigar as the hardest question. <laughs> you get the cigar for the hardest question. Thank you. Because there's not a lot of great examples. What worries me is, mm. um, I, I, I already told you, I think that the, 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 mega, the seeker megachurch, I still think is probably, it's, it's not the place a lot of the younger, justice-oriented, postmodern people are showing up. I yeah. still think it... it um, it's really not, the, it's not the way of the future, I don't think. Okay. Um, I, I would say if you can find a multi-ethnic church in a city that's growing and it's not compromising on any of those four things, on the, the sex, the pro-life, the 
uh, the justice, the racial, if it's multi-ethnic, if it's really equally sh evangelizing people, calling the repentance, and doing justice, uh, calling people to be to uh, be a sexual counterculture, and uh, work on being anti-racist. If you find a church like that that's growing, um, and and orthodox and true to the whole, you know, panel of those things, they're probably doing. What I'm, or they're probably doing what they ought to do, probably, mm -hmm. probably. Uh, go there. But I don't, if you mean a movement, a book, I mean, even... No, my, I, even I, I just mean, like, they're stuck in an old mindset. How do they begin to detach well, from you that and move forward? You could, re you, could, you could read Leslie Newbigin. Now, Newbigin died in 1999. Yeah. Um, and, and so he's already somewhat dated. I mean, he's already looking at a post-Christian West that has already moved from when he saw it. Yeah. And yet... He was just ahead of his time, and so I would, I would, if you could read Foolishness of the Greeks and uh, the Gospel in a Pluralist Society, I mean, Gospel in a Pluralist Society, I think yeah. that's right. Those two books would be great starting points. Okay. They'd be really good starting points. That's good. Anything else on the megachurch movement that you've seen over the last 40 years mm. develop? I, um, Knowing a lot of them are listening. Well, I, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I... I planted a megachurch yeah, I mean, by anybody's standards. Yeah. And at this point, I feel like um, I think it was the right thing to do to let it get that big. Mm. There wouldn't be a Redeemer City to City. There wouldn't yeah. be a counseling center. There wouldn't be Hope for New York. There wouldn't be all sorts of stuff. And I do think that for New York to grow an evangelical megachurch was a good thing for the whole ecosystem, I think. Yeah. Um, it is breaking up. I broke up Ma Bell. I mean, we we're already three and eventually be four or five, six churches. Yeah. So not, there is no 6,000 person Redeemer Church anymore. There's right. a whole slew of them. And I think that's good because mm. generally speaking, when a church gets over a thousand people, there's a, it, it really becomes much more bureaucratic. I'll give you two, two real quick. I mean, that I, I sounds kind of negative mm. about big churches. The, um, uh, the pastors can't know everybody. Yeah. Like I always say to a pastor, if you can interview every single new member personally, then your church is still small enough. And if you can't do that anymore, it's too big. Hmm. Secondly, what happens is, <clears throat> if you, listen, if you run a pharmacy, uh, you start a pharmacy, you're probably a pharmacist, you probably know how to stock the shelves, and then maybe you, you grow your pharmacy and then you form a second pharmacy and a third pharmacy even. Generally, the people running those pharmacies are still pharmacists. They actually know what it means to make it a good experience for people to come in the door and buy things. But when you have 50 pharmacies in a chain, <clears throat> the people running it know almost nothing about pharmaceuticals. They're just looking on ROI, return on investment, bottom lines. They're just operating like, um, um, they're basically financial people. Yeah. And what ends up happening in a very large church is more and more that both the staff and the, the lay leaders become people who are not so much doing the ministry at the bottom. They're not, they're not the pharmacists anymore. They're people who are looking at systems and doing all these things and I don't think that's healthy. Mm -hmm. So I actually have been saying, um, frankly, the, the city would be better off with 10 churches of 500 people in general than one church of 5,000. On, having said that, I think almost every city needs a couple of megachurches because they can do things nobody else can do. Mm -hmm. A couple. Yeah. But I wouldn't aspire to be the pastor of a megachurch. I just <laughs> want you to know that. <laughs> there you go. For, for the reasons I just mentioned, yeah. there's, uh, it's, a, it's a discipleship problem, mm. a lot of passivity, um, and there's a bureaucracy po problem where people spend an awful lot of time in just looking at systems instead of doing ministry. So. Um, I would say, looking forward, I think churches, uh, basically, I'm not a big house church fan, in spite mm. of the fact that Francis Chan and other people think it's the, it's the solution. Yeah. I would say moderate-sized churches, <laughs> you know, 100 to 800 is the way forward. Well, you're speaking to most of the people listening to or watching this. So yeah. I've got a list of questions that, uh, and you've been so generous with your time, but I'd love to close with this one. Sure. A lot of leaders listening in right now are discouraged, personally. 
It's been a tough season. It's hard at home. I'm yeah. sure you've had seasons of discouragement. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just tell us about a time where you felt discouraged and how you got yourself through it? <laughs> just so many. <laughs> <laughs> how will I ever choose uh. them? Uh, uh, you know, I, the hard, <clears throat> if you're talking about leadership, the hardest time was um, there was a, a period from about 2001 to 2005 or so that was tough for me as a leader because 9-11 mm -hmm. happened, and that's a whole big story. 9-11 yeah. in New York City is a, it's a world of, of discussion. I, I yeah. can't go there. But the whole city got depressed, and everybody mm -hmm. burned out. It was... It, it was a, the, the day after 9-11, day after, uh, a Christian minister from Oklahoma City who had been through the Oklahoma City bombing called and told me, um, you're going to have a lot of trouble in your church for the next three or four years. You're going to have people burning out. You're going to have people uh, grieving. You're going to have you're going to have all sorts of trouble. And he, he kind of gave me the list. Uh, on top of that, I got thyroid cancer. On mm -hmm. top of that, my wife had Crohn's disease, had a big flare-up, and had all, multiple surgeries on her body. And um, I stayed the pastor, but basically really let the staff kind of go. Mm. And when I actually came back to health after about two years, basically, I was still preaching and all that, I came back to health uh, and I sat down with my staff and I found out they were all bitter <laughs> because I'd, I'd left them on their own. And they also formed these little silos and they were actually all having turf battles and it was a wreck. It was a total wreck. And so I said, oh my gosh, are we ever gonna get out of this? And basically, I, frankly, I'll, uh, I did hire a new executive director, Bruce Terrell, who was probably the single biggest um, help at cleaning all that up and um, you know, reintegrating the staff mm. into a community. But for the about two or three years before that, I'm not sure how we made it other than to say, you've got to keep going, you've got to pray. Uh, my wife was so sick that at a certain point there I thought maybe I should leave the ministry. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't tell her about it because then she would feel guilty. But I couldn't tell anybody else about it because I felt I would betray her. Mm -hmm. So I didn't tell anybody. And I li lived with that for a couple of years and um, never really... Uh, uh, never really resolved it other than God never gave me the freedom to leave. Hmm. So prayer, that is when my prayer life really kicked in, in hmm. a new way. I mean, my prayer life changed drastically right during that period of time. Just deepened, got stronger, and pretty much worth it. The whole <laughs> thing was worth it just for that. So, but no, no key, you know, God sent in somebody was important. He deepened my prayer life. That's how, that's how you get through it. Tim, this has been rich, deep, and such a privilege. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for the thanks. <laughs> Tim Keller, welcome back. It's so good to have you. I'm glad to be with you. I wish we could do this face-to-face, -face, but uh, this is way better than nothing. Yes, it is. It is. It is. And we got that opportunity last time. And don't take it for granted anymore like, you know, perhaps we would have in the past. Well, the world has changed an awful lot since February of 2020. And your world, as I'm sure many of our listeners would know, has changed dramatically. Um, what would you say has changed most profoundly in your personal journey? You got a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, have been going through that. I would just love to know over the last year what what are you thinking about day to day? Well, yes, the the, um, the day after I found out I did have cancer, um, which was in May of last year, I, uh, the uh, sat down and uh, two words came to me as I was meditating and praying. Don't forget, I'm Presbyterian and you know not Pentecostal. So when you get words when you're Presbyterian, you really better write them down. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you usually don't get words here <laughs> and um they were uh your sanctification and focus and what that meant was first of all it was um and david knows this because uh his wife's been through this with a very very i also it's a similarly very bad cancer um the time is i'm not going to die tomorrow you know i've got i've got some time left but it's it's very limited 
And uh, so the number one, I, I, I realized that I needed to focus on certain things. I had to figure out what that was. I would say that a, a man who was, was 69 years old, I actually was pretty unfocused because the reality is it doesn't matter whether you have cancer or not. When you're approaching 70, you should actually know the time is short. You don't really have decades anymore. You've got years anyway. And so I should have been more focused, but I was tending to do whatever anybody asked me to do. Like most ministers get in the habit years before you just do, you're a nice person, you're a minister. So you do whatever anybody asks you to do. And um, I had no focus. I really didn't. I wasn't saying, what, is, what do I really, if I only had one year left, two, three, four, five years, what should I be doing? I didn't have that focus. Now I did. Secondly, the word sanctification was that God was was saying, if you would die of a heart attack at the age of 73, that wouldn't work because if you've got two years left or three years left, you're really not holy enough for what I have for you. You're not close enough to me. You're, you're not dependent enough on me. Too much of your faith is abstract. And therefore, I'm not going to take you suddenly by a stroke or a heart attack. I'm going to give you a really serious cancer. Uh, so that you are going to, the last part of your year of your life, you will be living with the prospect of death all the time in a way that you wouldn't if you were taken suddenly. And therefore, why? Why would he do that? Because he says, actually, you're not holy enough for what I have for you left to do. So, and you know, it made perfect sense. It was scary. You know, you, you, you sit down and you say, this isn't right. You know, Kathy, always said, I thought when we turned 70, we'd feel a lot older. And we didn't. And we were ready to go and ready to do all those sorts of things. So why? Why? This seems unfair. And then as soon as I thought about it, I said, actually, this makes perfect sense. I mean, God probably has a hundred million reasons why he's doing this to me. And I could only disturb one or two. But the two even I saw made ridiculous amount of sense. I said, of course. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what's changed. I mean, a lot has changed. The focus and just being drawn, just being pushed toward God in a way I wasn't before. Thanks so much for sharing with us, uh, Tim. And, you know, these, uh, these windows into these moments for you, uh, I've been, been trying to be faithful in, in, uh, in a similar journey with my wife's glioblastoma yeah. of, uh, lead, leading as publicly and as openly and unafraid as we can about, uh, all that. And it has been, you know, this, this, uh, revealer of what I try to control where, where real control comes from and, and what doesn't, what we do and don't really have impact on. And, uh, it's been a, a thing that's softened my heart for, you know, the, the, the place of the church, uh, and how we can really minister to people in their place of deep need. And, and, and also really recognizing through the pandemic, it was almost like, as soon as the pandemic hit, it's like, wow, I've got three years. I've been practicing what it looks like to, to lead through crisis because my wife's had uh, a terminal brain, brain tumor. And uh, so anyway, it's been uh, too, too many lessons to compress into two, a couple of minutes, but I appreciate you sharing that with us. You uh, wrote a very powerful piece. You've written a lot of powerful pieces, but your most recent piece in the Atlantic on death and dying, uh, I thought was very, very helpful. You said something interesting. I just want to pick up on I, and And if I got it slightly wrong, let me know, but you know, God is doing this to me. It's interesting. That sort of pushes at the theodicy. I'd love your, uh, take on suffering. Um, I thought what you quoted from, was it Charles Taylor was really helpful in the Atlantic and h how are you rethinking suffering? Well, I, I, um, the word rethinking is interesting. I mean, rethinking could mean I'm just going back through what I thought before. That's closer that rethinking sometimes can mean, um, uh, thinking in a new way about it, in a different way. I actually don't think I am thinking about it in a different way. I mean, I, I think most of what I believed about suffering was more head knowledge, and I hadn't really made it operational in my, in my life. That's, that's the main burden of the, um, the article that you read, hmm. was to say, when I went back and looked at what I believed about suffering, I did write a book on suffering, a whole book. <laughs> <laughs> with Johnny, with Johnny Erickson, who's kind of an expert on suffering, said it was the best book she'd ever read on it. Which she told me that personally, and I was thinking, "Oh wow, all right." I mean, that that's a high compliment. And yet, I you know I hadn't suffered as much as Johnny Erickson, so I hadn't used a lot. Of it. I mean, what well, you have, you've got a couple of things. The, the Bible, um, Christianity, a 
is the only religion that gives you a God who actually has suffered. I have to be very careful with the Trinitarian language here <laughs> because Jesus Christ, you know, was the son of God and he experienced suffering in his human nature. Okay. I, I do know all that. So when all the letters come in from the Trinitarian, you know, the Trinitarians, um, you know, you can say Tim understands that. Um, on the other hand, you know, Jesus Christ still has a body. That is, that is the teaching of all Christian churches, uh, all Orthodox churches, and it still has the nail prints. Uh, so when Hebrews said, says, you have a God, you have a Savior who has experienced whatever you're experiencing, there's no other religion gives you that. So, for example, have, did you put, let me just be, put feet on it. Have you ever lost a child? Have you ever lost a son? You know, outlived a son? Well, God has. Have you ever been betrayed by your best friends? Well, you know, Jesus has. See? Have you ever uh, faced certain, a certain painful death? Yes. I mean, so first of all, you've got someone, and, and Hebrews says, go to him because he knows. He's, he's been through it. Uh, and then secondly, you also have a God who is going to heal all suffering at the end of time. And then therefore, in the end, uh, and one, one, way to, one way to put this is, is if Jesus Christ really rose from the dead, if he really, really rose from the dead, so that that means that, that the, the teaching of the gospel in the Bible is true. So if he really rose from the dead, guess what? Everything's going to be okay. In the end, everything's going to be okay. David is going to be okay. Carrie's going to be okay. My, my wife is going to be okay. David's wife is going to be okay. It's, it, we're going to, it's everything's going to be fine. So you put those two things together. You've got a God who actually knows sufferings I can go through now when I'm in the midst of it. And then I can know that eventually, just hold on because it's going to be okay. And I, I, the other religions of the world actually don't, they don't offer that sort of thing. Even people that believe in paradise, we're talking about a new heavens and new earth. Christianity is saying, when we say everything's going to be okay, that means this world's going to be restored. We're not going to get a consolation for the loss of this world. We're actually going to get the world. So, uh, okay, so you say rethinking. Rethinking meaning I just have to go back and think again through all the stuff I already believe. I didn't change it at all. I, I, I had to appropriate it. I had to make it something that helped me get through the day. And, and uh, in that sense, yes, I rethought it. But basically, it's, I, I don't think right now the word rethink usually means I've changed. And I, I haven't, which is weird. You know why? Because it's so, it's so, it's such a, the Christian theology of suffering, the biblical theology of suffering is so potent. It's just sitting there unused by most people. So God has just said, nope, go get it. Go use it. You mentioned unfocused, which kind of surprised me, to be honest with you. I, I think of you as very focused. Um, any more on that? And then if you could go back a decade, 15 years, pick a time window, is there any way you would have changed your focus or become more focused, knowing what you know now? Well, I... I think what it means is that there are the things that you know you ought to be trying to spend most of your time doing, and then there's things everybody else asks you to do. Now, maybe, maybe, listen, maybe you are, will be different. Maybe you'll be different um, than me. I would think most people are like this, though. I mean, I'm an oldest child, um, and so I'm kind of like, I'm the, I mean, there's a lot of ways in which I'm probably worse than most people at trying to please people and keep them happy. Uh, I'm certainly worse than my wife. My wife is way better at saying, I just can't do that, you know, and knowing the person's going to be unhappy with her. And I, that, that's harder. So it's harder for me. Therefore, that might be why I'm more focused. But basically, when I say unfocused, meaning it didn't mean I didn't know what I should be doing. It's just that I never get to most of it because I was too busy with people who would say, you know, you can help me so much if you would write this, look at this, come speak here and do this. So I, I honestly think that uh, that's what I meant, that I just mm. wasn't able to be disciplined enough. And here's a, here's a gift about this. It's not only that I can really see that I have become more focused, but actually, frankly, the people around me are allowing me to do that. I mean, we're all selfish. We all say, Look, I know you're so busy, and I, I hate to ask you this, but you know, 
could you please do this for me? And uh, now people are actually being a lot more careful about, about it. So anyway, that's what I meant by focus, I think. Do you have a sense of what you want to zone in on over the next couple of years, what you really want to devote your time and energy to? Well, it, now here's the thing. You actually do know about that because we talked about it last time we talked. So, so many of the th- things we talked about saying that there is, a, and maybe we can talk more about it now, there yeah. really has been a cultural shift. Yes. And it's not just a cultural shift, actually. There's a cultural breakdown, which maybe we want to talk a little bit about, um, that, that therefore older ways of doing evangelism and Christian formation, I think, are in this country, are becoming obsolete. Mm-hmm. And so the truth is not, we're, I'm, we're not going to change the truth, but how we impart it, how we shape people with it, how we recommend it. So all the things we talked about before, maybe you should say, okay, the pandemic changed those things. I know you're going to get to questions like that. But, you can. but basically, I would say um, the things I talked to you about before, that's what it really would, what most concerns me, that the church is not able to form its own young people growing up. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the world is catechizing them in a way that we're not. And then secondly, even the way we do apologetics and evangelism, I think just, it's just going to have to, um, it's just going to have to change. And we talked about that so we can talk about it more right here if you want. I'd love to hear uh, one one thought about ways you think the, the church could better catechize young people. A lot of my life's work has really been focused on understanding this massive gap of those under age 40 and really under age 30 today, what are often called millennials and Gen Z. And I'm just convinced that we we've, we've, lost the heart of of so many of these young people the, the data to bear that out but even even those who are in the church are sort of being formed and malformed by culture uh what do you think some of the the reasons for that are and what would be a way we could think differently about that um as church leaders well i think i may i think i may have actually even used this illustration with carrie last time i can't remember but um that's okay because we we've, we've got to uh, it's a new time, and we have to talk about it again. Um, I think I may have mentioned, if you look at the real catechisms, I'm not saying that we have to actually write literal catechisms, though maybe we do. But the real catechisms, the older ones, they, you know, it's a question and answer. So if you go back and look at Luther's catechism, Calvin's catechism, Westminster, Heidelberg, all the various ones that were written during the Reformation, You'll notice things like this. You'll notice that they 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 ask very they make two or three questions about the Trinity, but then they'll ask you ten questions about justification or the sacraments or the Lord's Supper and things like that. And the reason is because you never catechize, you never really are just only um, teaching people what the Bible says. You're also inoculating them against the 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 dominant alternatives. So. If you were not a Protestant Christian in Europe in the 16th century, you'd be Catholic. In other words, the, the alternative to being catechized as a Protestant was you'd be a Catholic. That's the reason why the catechism actually was inoculating you against the counter narrative. Now, Catholics and Protestants have this very same beliefs about the Trinity, the deity of Christ, etc., but they don't have the same beliefs about salvation, how you receive salvation, justification you know, the Lord's Supper and things like that. And therefore, the catechisms are actually not just shaped by what the Bible says, but also what the alternative narratives are. I would say today, the alternative narratives, we, we are, are uh, the way we train younger people doesn't take on the identity narrative or the freedom narrative or the science narrative or the, you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they, they're very, very profound narratives and, and they're, getting them, they're getting them dozens of times a day in all sorts of ways. Uh, and, and unless we, to me, to, here's what inoculation, inoculation is giving people a little bit of the disease, but also one that actually uh, stimulates the antibodies, right? That's, that's, I mean, I just got vaccinated, by the way, about uh, COVID, so I'm just reading about that. And so what you want to do is you want to not just talk about the Trinity, but you want to say, how does the doctrine of the Trinity actually differ from what people say about human life today? I mean, how does it, uh, or what, what, what the Bible says about the gospel, how is that different than the identity narratives that are out there, that your primary identity is something that you find in yourself, or your primary identity is a racial one, 
Is that your primary primary identity? And you have to, we're going to have to have to engage those things in the way in which we do doctrinal training because the kids that they're being engaged. So you actually, you really can't just give them the kind of traditional doctrine that we've been given for 500 years and then hope that they make the connection. You have to say, if you believe this and this is true, then this doesn't work over here. And so that's, that. Uh, we're, we're, I, don't, I haven't seen almost any material that actually does that. It's all, uh, it looks abstract, but it's basically based on, by and large, most, most evangelical churches are really still trying to teach kids how not to be Catholic. That's actually not their biggest problem. So interesting. And I couldn't agree more. I, I think I'm just observing that so much of your work in the city in New York and a world of ideas and in a, in a world of, um, you know, so many people who are, who are socially and financially climbing and, and the, the sort of the, uh, con- sort of the contest for how faith fits into our largely secular age, um, gives you a, a context for that. And for me, what I've, um, uh, observed about this generation is that screens are discipling them. That is, is sort of the primary means by which they're being catechized by social media and, and technology and entertainment. And so the, the average church in not in New York City is now dealing with pressures that uh, would, have been, would have been the case you've been dealing with for, for many years. And so we really do need a, a complete reframe of the kinds of, you know, to use Jesus' metaphor, the, 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 the wineskins of helping to invest in younger generations. So it's a, it's a, the, the way you describe that is very inspiring to me, and I think it's so important. Yeah, in some ways, you know, we talked about uh, identity. I remember that very clearly from our conversation a year ago, how uh, people are seeing everything now through the lens of identity, whether it's gender identity, sexual identity, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and that the gospel actually addresses that. So in many ways, our earlier conversation talked about disruptions that were happening, and then COVID hit, and everything got accelerated. To what extent, what do you see accelerated, like any thoughts on, because obviously the world has changed, but like, I mean, what, what has got your attention now over the last year from a leadership theological perspective that perhaps got accelerated or changed by the pandemic? Well, I, th- I think the things that were happening before are going to continue to happen. I don't think it's completely clear to me yet how the pandemic is disrupting those trajectories. I don't think they're reversing any of them. I, d- I don't believe the pandemic's reversing them. But some will be accelerated, some will be decelerated, and some will just be thrown off the older track. I mean, I'm just trying to think. So, for example, uh, we did not talk about this, Carrie, and uh, okay. one of the problems with even getting into this one is because it's actually unfortunately political. But the reality is that the middle class is sort of going away. And the reason is, and there's a fair amount of good research that I believe in, is that is that basically... Uh, Wage, wage, how do I say? Labor is not as valuable as assets. Mm -hmm. So the people who can live off of their investments um, are pulling away from the people who have to go out and earn a living, you know, with wage. And and so and and that's getting that we know the pandemic we know has made that worse because we we definitely know that very wealthy people have become far wealthier during this pandemic, virtually. Almost everybody who's really wealthy and has enough money to have, you know, a portfolio out there, they've just done extraordinarily well. And we do know that that there's a bit for a lot of reasons why blue collar labor is a bit. I mean, blue collar labor has been hit so hard. Hmm. There's a lot of jobs that may not come back, and and so there's just one example of the of the the growing economic inequality that is really fueling a lot of the problems. Uh, politically is not it, in any ways getting worse. Uh, on the other hand, we just think about another one is, um, well, I guess on identity, okay, here's a change, Gary, here's a change. Um, one secular identity approach, which is non-Christian, of course, is I call the therapeutic model, which is you look inside, you find out your deepest desires and whatever's in there, you decide that's the real me. You don't, you don't, Identity is not found in God or in my family or in my duties. It's found in, I want to see my deepest desires and I have to realize those desires. And that's my identity. The other, another approach, which we already knew about before was, um, 
if I am a, a minority, that's my main identity, which means, in other words, because I'm, I'm not white, I'm not male, I'm not straight, uh, there's, a, there's a virtue in that. And so my primary identity is I am a, um, um, I've been a marginalized person. And that's, that's another approach, which I think is certainly not the Christian approach. But here's the other thing. is Christian nationalism, which is a fusion of America. Okay? Of course, the Canadians have no problems with this because they're just so sanctified here. But we Americans have this, well, actually, you, you, don't, you don't have the same problem with it. Um, and the reason for that is the evan- evangelicalism in Canada is too small. Very small. It's too small for this to have happened. But down here, where it's bigger is you now have a, a, a number of people who are saying, you're not a real American unless you're a white Protestant Christian. We don't want Muslims here. We don't want all these immigrants here. And you're getting a few, it's really a kind of, it's a new, a new identity politics, only it's a right-wing identity politics. And it's a fusion of Christianity with being a white American. And so, in, so there's that one. There's a the therapeutic individualistic one. There's the kind of progressive victim one, and now there's a right-wing one. And they're all um, what we would call in Christianity, they're all identity heresies. I mean, they're they're all ways of thinking about identity that are really, really uh, very destructive. We think they're destructive to the people who are adopting them as their primary identities. And all of them are absolutely against what the Bible says, how identity works. And so that's a change. I wouldn't even have said that a year ago with you, that right wing kind of identity. Um, and yet there they are. So in a sense, nothing is stopped, but there some things are going faster, some things are going slower, and some things are kind of taking <laughs> taking some detours. But they're all kind of all of our political and cultural and economic crises are still heading in that direction, but. We don't completely know yet how the pandemic is changing things, but they, it is still changing things pretty profoundly, but not not reversing anything. One of the things we saw in our uh, tracking research is this the profound impact that the pandemic has had on pastoring and on leading uh, leading congregations, which is which is primarily about bringing people together. Was well, about a lot of things, but but the expression of that is yes. is on Sunday morning worship. And so um, we saw in our data, three in 10 pastors say they've seriously considered uh, quitting this year um, and, and speak about um, h- how you find our um, yeah. s- sort of deepest, truest calling in ministry and a time when things sort of all bets feel like they're off. Yeah. Well, now, you know, you're talking to a person who actually, because I was retired, I'm retired. You know, I mean, I stepped out of being a leader of a church three years ago. So I'm not actually experienced in this, but I mean, I, I can certainly speak to it because I'm talking to plenty of folks, but I, I do have to say uh, to Kathy, I said, you know, I got pancreatic cancer, but at least I'm not actually a working pastor right now. <laughs> I mean, I was trying, <laughs> I've said that some days. Uh, I said, man, I do, would not want to be out there trying to pull things together. Here's the thing, Dave and Carrie, like there's not a single pastor recently that anybody has said, you're doing a great job. Mm. I was like, it's been because n- nobody is doing a great job because it, nobody's, there's no wins. I mean, in the very, very beginning, when you went online, there did seem to be a little bit, I say, oh my goodness, we have, you know, we have a church of 300, but a thousand people are watching us every, every Sunday. Well, after a while, people begin to realize, okay, here's a thousand people that they're watching, but we don't know if that one person is five, got five folks in a family at home. And we also don't know if that one person is somebody in Iowa who's just tuning into your church in New York because they used to go, you know, in other words, and you begin to realize we still actually don't really know who we've got and what's going on. And basically, I think the main thing is not only is everybody tired, uh, but nobody's getting any positive affirmation. See, yeah. almost always you've got some wins every year, some things, oh, isn't it great? The Lord's doing this and the Lord's doing that. And like, oh, no, almost nobody's getting any pats on the back. Nobody's saying this is great. Um, so you're, you're just running and running to try to keep things together. And there's no, there's no hugs, literally no hugs. Yeah. So it's, it's like, uh, you're getting, they're getting absolutely no, no affirmation. Um, and there have been, uh, and also there's, uh, there, there's, 
you know, there are, there's just a tremendous amount of loneliness, a feeling of being separated from so many people that we care about. We just can't live this way. So I, on the other hand, I wouldn't say, I'm not sure that pastors are necessarily more depressed than everybody else. Cause I, a young, you know, teenagers, a friend of mine's son just tried to commit suicide, 16 years old. Not, not all that unusual. Not up here in New York. An awful lot of the kids are just feeling cut off and like there's no hope. And so, yeah. Anyway, it's the the biggest problem is you don't really know who's with you, who's really left, who's coming back. You don't really get any kind of real decent feedback. And the Zoom, there's, we can talk a little bit about, about remote Zoom call stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it it is way way better than nothing. Way way better. But at the same time, it's still not. We're in our. We have bodies, and we we really do need to be in the presence of each other. I think so. Yeah, we uh, we. I want to be respectful of the time, and I definitely want to talk about your new book, uh, which is which is about hope <laughs> in uh, in the face of difficulty and fear. Um, but let's talk a little bit about digital church. I think almost every church is now online. And uh, probably, you know, as David has written about at uh, Barna, um, hybrid church appears to be a big part of the future. I'd love your thoughts on that. What are the limits? What are the potentials? What are what are the dangers? The traps? Huh. Well, let me let me go to the, let me let me be negative and then dial it back. I don't know if I should do it that way. Maybe I should be positive and dial it back. <laughs> but wait, for example, um, Dr. David Martin Lloyd Jones. Um, was, a, was a, just a tremendous preacher. Uh, uh, for those of you, my guess most of, most of your audience will know who he is, but he was a British preacher uh, in a big church in London, the heart of London, for many years, basically through World War II in the 50s and 60s and even in the 70s, I think it was. And he, he preached to big congregations. For a long time, he resisted allowing his sermons to be recorded. And the... Um, the reason for that was, uh, and for, uh, we're all very grateful, eventually he allowed himself to be recorded, but his argument was a pretty hard to refute. Um, it wasn't a good enough reason not to listen, I mean, not to, not to record them, but what he said is, do you really think that if you are walking along or driving in your car and listening to a sermon, that it will have the same shaping impact on you? As if you are in the presence of the of the congregation, uh, you're in the presence of the minister who's preaching. You have been uh, you've been praying together in you know body next to body next to body audibly. You've been praying together. You've been singing God's praises together, and then the minister speaks to you. Do you really think you're going to be as shaped by the sermon, by the word of God, as you're driving along in your car as you would be if you were in that spot? in the body, in front of, you know, in the gathered community. He says, of course not. And you know, when, when he says that, you begin to say, of course he's right. Hmm. And by the way, I've been on, just like you have, a zillion Zoom calls. And the reality is, it is still easier. I mean, you know, you're really only this, sorry guys, you're only about this part. If I was in your presence, you would actually be mine. You would, you would fill my field of vision. You don't. Hmm. You're like this, and everybody knows that people do look at their email during Zoom calls, and they do. In other words, you are not as present. You just simply are not. And yet, it's so much better. I keep thinking, boy, ten years ago, we just these would be conference calls on the phone. It, it is still better because I'm actually seeing faces, and so I'm seeing your body. And I think I'm we're incarnate beings, and beings, and even seeing a person's body is better than just listening to their their voice. Nevertheless, it, the the there is uh, it will it can't replace. I'll give you one more example of this. Mm. Uh, it can't replace in person experience. Therefore, what's on the other hand, it does reach a whole lot of people. Let me give you two examples. I've been teaching students, and uh, I teach preaching. I teach ministry students in the city. On the one hand, the Zoom the Zoom only, which is what we've done is really helpful because people's lives are so busy. They are so crazy and busy that the I get perfect attendance every time. And before that, you know what? Listen, honestly, people trying to juggle all the stuff they're juggling and still get ministry training in the city is um, they, 
you know, I, always I had about 10 to 15 percent of the people could never make, you know, it was always some uh, absenteeism and they, and they didn't like. So this they, a lot of them say this is really helpful. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, they also realize that though they're 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 staying with me, they're not getting to know each other. That's yeah. a big problem. They're not getting to know each other, which is a very big part of um, being part of a, if you're in a class of 15, uh, other people who are learning preaching and you live in the same in New York City, at least four or five of those people are going to become real good friends and they're really going to be a big help to you. But what's happening with the Zoom is they're not becoming really good friends. They're all getting me really well. And I'm not even sure, frankly, that they're, if, if, if anything, I would say the vertical, you might say the relationship to Getting the content from the minute from the instructor is probably almost as good, if not a little better, because there's a, there's a discipline to it and nobody misses. But when it comes to the horizontal aspect of, of the education, it's a lot worse. And so all I'm trying to say is something in the middle, brothers. Mm. Uh, I think I think we can probably draw a lot more people in evangelistically if we're really smart on how we use a uh, digital church. I do not think we should just go back to the way it was. I think there's a ton of people out there who are more online than they used to be, and they're more afraid of commitment than they used to be. And this is perfect for reaching a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't even know anything about your church. On the other hand, here's my last example. Kate Bowler, uh, you might know who she is. She's a Duke University. She, she teaches at Duke Divinity School. She's got stage four colon cancer, I think. She's got some kind of cancer. Young mother. Um, she's kind of making it right now, but once I met her at one point and she said, the thing that's frightening to her is that because she's written a couple books on her cancer and all that thousands of people through the internet are trying to say, oh, you're helping me so much. And she's come to realize that people are so disembedded from community that they're trying, they're looking to her as a celebrity sufferer to minister to her and she, uh, to minister to them. And she's saying, you can't do that. You need a community. And she's realizing, and she's talking to all these other people who are suffering like she is, and they've got cancer. They don't have communities like they used to. They, it, things are so mobile. They're not near extended family. They're not near. They just, they, they're all alienated from the church. They don't like the church. So they don't have any community. And she said, I'm sorry, a, a, on a web, a website for, you know, for a celebrity sufferer is not going to be what you need if you've got cancer. You need somebody to make you chicken soup. You know, I can't do that. You need somebody to do those things for you. And and so that's what makes, makes me say, I think we're going to be somewhere smack in the middle. That when it's all over, we're going to say, there's a lot of things we can do digitally that are actually going to involve more people. We're going to be able to do better education. We're going to do, be able to do better outreach. And yet at the same time, we, we, we have to use the digital to woo people into face-to-face relationships or they're not really going to be changed by the gospel. It's interesting, you know, because I, I think you're totally right about community, and I'm sure you get those letters too. You know, Tim, I'm really struggling with X, and you know, I when I get them, it's like you need to talk to somebody who knows you and know, knows the situation, right? Like I don't know. Uh, here, here's a question for you. One of the critiques of large church, and you pastored a very large church. You're there with hundreds or a thousand other adults. That's not really community either. Arguably, you're in a moment. You're in an experience. One of the trends that's emerging is what we might call micro churches or distributed gatherings where perhaps we're not in a, a building owned by the church, but I could be gathering in my home with 10 other Christians and perhaps a neighbor who's experiencing Jesus for the first time. So it's like an iteration of small group. Um, any, any thoughts on that? And then perhaps you're, you're watching digitally, but you're gathered in person. This is like post-vaccine, all that stuff. Well, it's a little, yes, it's a little too impermanent is the big problem. Mm. One, one, one of the things I know that here's where you you don't want, you want to say to Christians, are you really being shaped by what the Bible says or by your culture? The culture is anti-institutional in the extreme. And and what is an institution? It's something that actually um, keeps going when the people are gone. Because <laughs> the institution has its own, its own, uh, its own being. And one of the big problems we've, uh, over the years, every, I'll tell you, I've been here 32 years. 
we still haven't had a really great house church movement in New York City. Hmm. And the reason is what, what, what is the impermanence? People get very excited, but if you, it's a, it's a mobile world now. And, and something that really is just changing your life. Oh my goodness. And suddenly half the people move away over a six month period and it falls apart. And there's no, there's no bigger community that you can go to to form another one or to be part of. And then you feel almost left out. So rather than micro church, I still think though, every city needs an ecosystem in which you have all size churches. And I would just speak a church of five or 6,000 can do things that no other church can do. And they do them for the whole city. You can, they can start counseling centers. They can start church planning centers. They can start things that everybody in the city gets to use. On the other hand, as a minister, Gary, you're absolutely right that there's a huge number of people that hide in a big church. They say, that's my church, but they're really not being formed by it. They're just too, they, they, they're really around the edges of it. So in general, I would certainly say that in general, in general, a city would be far better served and, and the individuals in the church would be far better served by 10 churches of 500 rather than one church of 5,000. The neighborhoods would be reached better. The people in them would be deployed better and pastored better in general. And yet, if you think I'm saying that, there should, that no, the city should never have churches of 5,000, actually every church, every city needs big churches. So. There we go. I'd love to draft back and talk just a little about uh, the journey of suffering that I've been on uh, this last four years with my wife's uh, disease and then her passing in October. And I I mentioned to you before we started recording that I've been really benefiting from the book you and Kathy, your wife wrote, um, uh, The Songs of Jesus, a daily meditation in the Psalms. And uh, for for me, at least, um, the Psalms have been one of the few places in scripture I can go routinely because it does express this full range of a God I can believe in who can sort of be a recipient of all my anger and frustration and loss and questions and also my deepest uh, place of trust and hope. And um, I just love to know what your, what your rhythms have been like since your diagnosis. Uh, you, you alluded a little bit to this uh, in the Atlantic article, but love to hear you t- tell our listeners a little bit how, how you're finding uh sort of finding p- peace and solace and t- to what extent you are uh, in scripture and in your faith during this time. Well, um, Kat, Kat, first of all, Kathy and I, I'll just tell you exactly what we do when it comes to just the, the nuts and bolts. Kathy reads three chapters. We, we do the McShane reading calendar, which is a way to get through the Bible in a year. I read four chapters a day, which gets you to the Old Testament once the New Testament twice in a year. Kathy reads three chapters a day. Um, that's all she can take in. She said, but we, but we do the three chapters she reads, I'm reading too. So it's a way of saying what's God saying to us today. Um, secondly, I still do the Psalms every month. Uh, you might, that is to say, I use the book of common prayer. Uh, so I read, pray, uh, Psalms morning and evening, and you get through 150 every month. And, uh, David, I mean, if you, the advantage of doing that is you, you run the gamut of it. And um, there, every day there's something that just speaks right to you because the Psalms go through every possible, uh, you might say, emotional condition you can be in any situation right. that, that human beings can have. And so we're up and down a lot, as you know. You, can be, you, can, you get some good news or, you know, your wife or I, you know, in my case, it's me really feeling good and we go do something and as you know uh, ordinary things if you do them well and you're feeling good that day can be more precious than they used to be you took them for granted and so those days the psalms you just hit a psalm that's a, filled with thanksgiving and other days you hit a psalm that i mean you're always hitting psalms that are exactly what you were feeling yeah right and it's just so i don't know what to say it's so empowering i hate to use that word I shouldn't have used that word. It's just so overused. Um, it's it, but it is empowering to see it reflected in the Word of God, and then very often more eloquently. Sometimes the depth of the anger or the questions of God feel like, wow, I'm, I, you know, it's it's even stronger than I would express it. But it is, it taps into something deeper in me. It's one of the things. Uh, I think my confidence in Scripture, as I've grown older, has only increased. 
because Ecclesiastes feels like it's so written for an ambitious person like yeah. me who who, yeah. who realizes all the end of this ambition isn't going to amount for much or in the case of Psalms, uh, a, a place for, you know, uh, crying out to the Lord, uh, Lamentations. It's such a fascinating uh, part of the story of Lamentations, like the great is thy faithfulness. Uh, that song actually is birthed in a, in a lament. And uh, that was my wife's, Jill's favorite song and even sung at our wedding. And so this idea of, God was tying a whole thread of his, his goodness for us, even in our sorrow uh, from the very first day that our wedding began. And, and so then she, when she said, Hey, I want you to plan my funeral to play, you know, great is thy faithfulness. It was a pretty tough day. Uh, but the sense in which the, the goodness of God to, to provide for us yeah. a scriptural basis for lament and, uh, and for, you know, for our suffering has been for me a, uh, a, uh, a place that I couldn't, I couldn't have imagined going and I couldn't have imagined it providing a, a greater anchor to my soul uh, than it has. Oh, I feel like I'm on holy ground. Well, I do want to talk about your book, uh, Hope in Times of Fear. Um, the world needs hope. We need hope. People are going, leaders listening, pastors listening. I think you're right. They're very unaffirmed for the last year. There have been no wins or very few. Um, uh, many listeners are navigating their own personal health crisis or the death of a loved one or um, dissolution of a board or tribalization and politics and division in the congregation and so on. Close us on some hope. Tell us what's in the book. Obviously, it's about the resurrection, but I would love for you just to give us a pastoral word as we, we close up. Well, I read the book was originally... Um, was supposed to be a kind of a, a short book, you might say a, a companion book to a book I wrote not that long ago on, on Christmas, which was a series of little meditations on Christmas. So actually my publisher originally said, how about a book on Easter, you know, some meditations on Easter. So I had already started the book and then the pandemic hit and then I got, you know, I got the cancer diagnosis. And, and here I'm working on the resurrection. And well, that, that it didn't change it technically. It just it certainly expanded. It certainly made this much more. I don't know how to say it. I mean, obviously, working on a book day after day when you're struggling with all the the bad news about your cancer, and yet the book is just filled with all the good news. I mean, they, I mean, the resurrection um, is first of all, if the resurrection happened, then everything's going to be okay. Okay. Um, and that's the first chapter in the book. So I went back and redid the Tom Wright, the N.T. Wright, um, uh, so much of his scholarship, not just his big, thick book, which is The Resurrection of the Son of God, which is the best book written on the resurrection in the last hundred years. But he's actually done other work since then. And so I put all that together, plus a few other, my, some of my own thoughts, but not mainly his thoughts in chapter one. Because if, if the resurrection happened and whatever else, it's going to be okay. The other thing, though, is we don't know what to do with the resurrection practically. You know, I have a I have a systematic theology of Charles Hodge, who was a Princeton theologian. You know, uh, in his systematic theology, 128 pages on the cross, on the on the death of Christ, four on the resurrection, <laughs> because we we tend to think, well, the resurrection it happened, and that proves he's the Son of God. But how does that change my life? It's sort of like a, a magic trick almost that proves that God, you know, is real. But actually, the resurrection does change everything because if the resurrection happened, not only is there hope, and that means confidence in the future, but secondly, the resurrection actually teaches, the New Testament teaches, that when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, he brought the powers of the age to come. That's what, into our world now. So our, the kingdom of God is present, but not present, as, as you heard before. If you just read what Jesus says in the Synoptic Gospels about the kingdom, it's very confusing because sometimes he talks about the, pre the kingdom as if it's present. It's going to be here. It's here now. It's in your midst. Other times he talks about when I come back, you know, with all my angels to, to bring the kingdom. And you say, well, is it here or is it not here? And the answer is, yeah. Uh, that when Jesus rose from the dead, he brought the powers of the age to come through the Holy Spirit into our lives now. The very 
the very power that's going to actually completely cleanse the world of all suffering, evil, and death at the end of time is already in our lives now, not fully, but partially. And what's perfect about that is it's just perfect for every day. You know why? Because on the one hand, it keeps you from either um, a naive optimism that if I really pray, I'll be healed. And anybody who's not healed, you're not praying. Well, that's an over realized view of the kingdom is that you're acting as if the kingdom is completely present well it's not or we're going to get out there we're going to change the world and get rid of all the systemic racism well you're not because the, not until jesus comes back on the other hand if you're just too pessimistic you know we're defeated there's no reason to pray god never heals anymore there's no reason we can make any changes things are terrible the culture is falling apart let's get the wagons together in a circle and just hold hands that's also, that's not the doctrine of the resurrection. You've got a real power, the power of the age to come. That's Hebrews talks about that, is in your life now. And, and amazing things can happen. So it's like, pastorally, it's perfect. And it's because it keeps me from being either cynical or naive. And whenever I tend to cynicism, the, the doctrine of the resurrection pulls me back. When I tend into naivete, and, and start to get like, oh, everything's going to be fine now because we started, you know, I got a good scan. And then forgetting, no, I'm sorry, it's not till the very end of time will everything be okay. So the resurrection is not something that just is a wonderful sign of, it's not an, just an apologetic proof that God exists, whether Jesus is the son of God. It's actually something I get it, got to get out every single day. The other thing, by the way, Carrie, the other thing is it's, the resurrection is paired with the death of Christ. It's the death and resurrection of Christ that saves us, which means God tends to work through weakness. Mm -hmm. So that when you know you're going to experience a lot of weakness, then you have to say, but God brings resurrection. Elizabeth Elliot was a good te a teacher of ours at Gordon-Conwell. She used to say, everything in the Christian life is, is a resurrection after a death. So she says, for example, if somebody wrongs you, you might just say, I'm just going to go pay them back. I'm just going to tell them how awful they are. Or I could forgive them in my heart and then go and, and urge them to see what they've done wrong. She says that that's like a death because you want to just slash their eyes out, but you don't. You, I'm going to forgive. And so it's like a death. But if you don't go through that death, probably if you just go and scratch their eyes out, that person will not listen to you. They'll just get worse at what they were doing. And your friendship is over. But if you go through the death of forgiveness, in a sense, there's a possibility of a resurrection of that your, your friend might actually see the, the, the truth and a resurrection of, of the relationship. And she says, everything is like that. Every time you obey God, you're sort of dying to your self-will. And yet you're rising again to become a person of virtue. And eventually you're going to really die in order to be raised. And so everything in the Christian life and in life is about death and resurrection. So that so it's not right that we have four pages on the resurrection. I wrote 230. <laughs> I've corrected Charles Hodge, and I sure hope that he appreciates it. <laughs> Sorry. Tim, you've been uh, fantastically generous with your time. And I just want to echo what David said when we began. I, I just personally am so grateful uh, for you, for your ministry, for your writing. Um, keep writing. We're going to keep praying for you. We are in your corner. And uh, thank you so, so much for being with us today. I really think that the good scans and all that are largely because of prayer. And David certainly knows what it's like to have your whole family just lift, you know, basically kind of like moving along on pe other people's prayers. Exactly. You, really, you, really, you can tell the difference. You know when people are praying. So <laughs> thank you. Tim, it's a delight to have you back. I'm so glad to talk to you again. And I I, I appreciate you, Carrie. And I know what you, the burden that you are having to spell your name to everybody every day. Say, no, that's not how you spell my last name. I just I just appreciate the way in which you uh, carry that burden with grace. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, I think it was in kindergarten I realized, oh, this is not going to be easy. Like uh, other kids get like simple names and here I am with Newhoff. But the good news is you get to own the internet, right? You can misspell it and they still find you. That's true. That is true. If they can, if they can spell it though, you know. <laughs> yeah, you have to come within some 
closeness of spelling it. If you're going to look up what people are saying about you on the internet, you're probably going to have to put in five or six different spellings because they're probably under, especially on Twitter. There's probably, there's probably Carrie, you know, C-A-R-E, C-A-R-Y-N-E-W-H-O-F. And I bet there's all kinds of stuff that have been said about Carrie Newhoff there that you've never even seen. Well, but and that might be is. a good thing, isn't it? It, it, <laughs> that might, it be might be a really be. good thing. It, it might be, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'd love to start with a little update on how you're doing. Uh, I've been praying for you. I know I've been joined by many, many people. How, how are you feeling? How is your health? Well, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about that, but very briefly. I, I've had, I have pancreatic cancer stage four. Uh, that was first spotted, actually, in February of 2020. And as most of your listeners probably know, uh, it's very deadly. And the fact that I'm about to celebrate my third Christmas with my children and grandchildren is a great gift of God. I've had good doctors and I've done chemo. And right now I'm in, I'm in an immunotherapy trial, a drug trial. Um, but, uh, and I'm just, you know, I, you, you have cancer, you live from scan to scan, basically. The last scan was great, but then, you know, another scan is going to come up and it's going to come up in a few, um, you know, weeks or a month or two or something like that. So, but I, meanwhile, in spite of the fact that I can't do it nearly as much as I used to do, especially travel, um, I can stay productive. In other words, I can still do a lot of things and write a lot of things, talk to a lot of people. So I'm extremely grateful. That's the sum. Yeah. Wow. Well, we'll continue to pray for you. And thank you for continuing to write. We're going to talk about a couple of your most recent works, which I imagine were written in the last year or two, too, yeah. while you've uh, been going through this. Um, so let's start with the the article, the series of articles that you released on the rise and decline of the mainline and then the evangelical church and then the re- the potential renewal of the church, which, by the way, we'll link to in the show notes. And you can get the individual articles, but you also wrote a PDF, which is much more detailed and mm-hmm. has an extensive bibliography. So um, what are the differences, maybe we'll start here, between the decline in the mainline church that we saw kind of a generation ago yeah. and the decline that we're seeing today in the evangelical church? Well, the similarities are um, that both the mainline church a generation ago and now the evangelical church more recently have essentially uh hook themselves up to a particular political program. Obviously, the mainline church just became essentially completely uh, hooked up to the Democrats and uh, to liberal progressive democratic uh, politics and saying that this is the only really Christian way to be. Uh, And that decline happened quite a while ago. On the other hand, back by the 70s, for example, on the other hand, the evangelical church has more recently made the same move it has, um, as at least in the public's mind, I'm not saying this is true of every single person in the main line or of the you know, evangelical church, but largely, and in the public's mind, the evangelical church is seen as having hooked up to the Republican Party, especially to a very conservative wing of the Republican Party. And so in the same way, uh, we have also, the evangelical church has sort of said, this is the only Christian way to be politically. And so I think the population on the whole sort of sees both churches as basically a power block and not really speaking uh, to the transcendent issues that all human beings have. Um, the, I think what's interesting is uh, the difference, by the way, is that whereas the, the mainline church jettisoned orthodox doctrine, it jettisoned the idea of the authority of the scripture and the deity of Christ and the return of Christ and all that. and they thought they were getting with the times, but what's actually happened is they're cut off now from 80, 90% of the world church, which is, which is growing. Hmm. And it, it's very embarrassing that, uh, you know, there's 2 million Episcopalians in America, a very liberal church. And yet like there's 11 million Anglicans in, you know, in, uh, uh, Uganda alone. Wow. 
Wow. And there's twice that much in, in Nigeria, and they're all Orthodox. And the same thing has happened for the Methodists. In other words, the, right. the, the church here is Methodist, it's sort of liberal, but worldwide Methodism is not. So they've actually cut themselves off from the growing edge of the church and the world church. Evangelicals have not, which I think means because we haven't cut ourselves off and because we haven't jettisoned Orthodox doctrine, at least not yet, we haven't, it means in some ways there's something there to be revived. Hmm. And there's something there to be revived, especially if we, because I believe, of course, Orthodox doctrine is true and biblical, but I also believe it keeps us in touch with the, with the uh, world church. And therefore, I have little or no real hope for any kind of renewal with the main line, but I have a lot more hope renewal with the evangelicals. When I say a lot more, I mean, that's a low bar compared to how I feel about the main line. The evangelicals, I still don't, I'm still worried, very, very, very worried, but I do think there's something there. No, and it is, it is helpful, and yet you don't exactly whitewash the issues of the evangelical church. And okay. in that paper, yeah. which again, we'll link to, you know, you do make a distinction between white evangelicalism and other forms of evangelicalism. And I'm not sure we'll have time to get into all seven traits that mark the social history of white U.S. evangelicalism, but could you give us a little overview of how white evangelicalism is because it's in a free fall right now some of those traits and how that has become counterproductive yeah i can name them at least and that way sure, yeah. whether we can go yeah. into them or i can name them all. and yeah, please. um well one is there's a moralism uh it's it's it tends to be moralistic which means self-righteous it's separatist which is in in general uh white evangelicalism or you want I, I, some people are going to say this is just fundamentalism. Okay, well, that's we can talk about that. But that uh, fundamentalism and evangelicalism are, in some ways, just joined at the hip, um, and it's always very hard to tell quite where the where the divide is. But the point is, uh, conservative evangelicals are moralistic and self righteous. They tend to be separatistic. They don't really like to engage. They feel like it's compromising. They, they see good and evil in kind of Manichaean ways. You know, we just have to denounce and withdraw. Okay. Number three, they're, they're very individualistic. It's all about just me and getting myself right and getting to heaven. Uh, four, uh, it's dualistic, which goes together with individualism. It's dualistic where it's, it basically tends to, you know, pit uh, Christianity against culture. Uh, we, we either withdraw from culture uh, or we fight it, but there's no idea of, uh, that there's, it, it goes along with, uh, the separatism, but it's, it's there. It, in other words, the, the world is bad and everything in the church is good. Instead of seeing that the world has got common grace and the church has got, you know, uh, sin in it, but instead dualism, it's like, it's all good or evil. Anti-intellectualism is a major, um, trait of american evangelicalism you don't see it in the british as much for example hmm. you know when you take it you know why is it that when i was first coming to be a christian in 1970 in the 70s why why is it that almost every as a college educated kid everything i read you know whether it was c.s lewis or j.i packer or john stott they were all british and it's because uh in america you just have an anti-intellectualism and you just really didn't have books written for college educated people um, then there's an anti-institutionalism, uh, which means evangelicals just like to set up their own shop, their own organizations. Uh, they just don't like to become part of existing institutions and existing organizations. They, just, they like to do it themselves. Highly entrepreneurial, but also anti-institutional. So the stuff to kind of, they, they don't build things that last. Uh, and finally, Inculturation, that is to say, there's a tendency to wed uh, Christianity to American culture. So it's the reason why, yeah, there's a, I would say there certainly is grounds for uh, the gender roles. I think the Bible does talk about there's differences between male and female, but there's a tendency amongst evangelicals and fundamentalists in America to exaggerate those and, and basically read anything traditional American gender roles back into the Bible. 
Uh, also, there's nationalism, which is the idea that we're the greatest country in the world. You kind of read your Americanism back into the Bible. Um, and so uh, there we are. Moralism, separatism, individualism, dualism, anti-intellectualism, anti-institutionalism, enculturation. And if you want to find out where they came from, you got to kind of read um, both Nate Hatch, his book, Dem uh, The Democratization of American Christianity, and Mark Knoll, Mark Knoll stuff. And basically, they they essentially say that kind of what happened back in the 1820s and 1830s, American evangelicalism, in order to really grow on the frontier, had to go to a less educated ministry. Uh, it, it just went anti, how do you say, it went populist in the 1830s. It's a long story. And you know what, mm. I've, I've already taken too long on this question. This podcast is not lasting three hours, so I should uh, make my questions uh, a little shorter. But they, they explain why American evangelicalism has been so anti-intellectual, populist, you know, of the people, but then really not trusting the academy, the university, not trusting science, just not trusting, you know, people with degrees, just not, just not trusting them. So... Yeah. And which of those, like if you had to pick a couple and maybe it's a false question and if so, we can move on. But which of those do you think in this moment has become the most damaging? Because I was just looking over the Barna data this morning, uh, doing some writing. And I mean, we are in a bit of a free fall. There's a yeah. little uptick after. Uh, but when you look at Gen Z, I mean, mm -hmm. they're spiritually open, but Christianity is just not very interesting to younger adults. Well, if you read if you read those seven i don't think i'm going to pick one out they, they really are involved with each other the, the seven when i was working on it i could have made it three i could have made it five because they kind of overlap um but i i, I broke them out because i i think it's a um uh if i'm trying to think here is there a way for me to summarize it it's a uh I, I, did, I think the two things would be the moralism and the um, the fear of um, uh, in a kind of I don't want to be mean here a kind of fear of ceremonial impurity. Uh, I like I'm going to get in, I, I'm just going to be harmed if I read this book or if I if I associate with these people. And see that is moralism ultimately. It's not it's not the confidence. You know Jesus was eating with 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 you know, prostitutes and sinners and people like that. And the religious leaders of the day were saying, how could he, you know, if you're a real man of God, why would you have anything to do with him? Mm -hmm. And because Jesus understood who he was and he understood the gospel of grace, he was just not afraid of being uh, made impure. And I do think that, the, that I don't, I really do think a lot of evangelicals and they, they can articulate the gospel. I'm saved by grace, not by works. But deep in its heart, it's pretty moralistic. And the way you do that is you stay pure and you keep your doctrine right and you live in all these ways. And then you start looking down on people and you separate from people. So I, get, I think it's the moralism, the lack of grasp of the gospel and the particular way that that has played out in American history. I found it also really helpful in the paper. Uh, do you call it a paper? It feels like a mini book. It feels like there's a book there, Tim. Um, and uh, I hope one day there will be. Yeah, I think it's about uh, a half a book. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's the, um, yeah, it's, a, it's like, it's the spine of a book. So yes, thank you. But anyway, what, 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 <laughs> well, did, you, what did you say? It's robust. Okay. No, but you also trace out racial history and yeah, evangelicalism yeah. and make a distinction between white evangelicalism and other forms of evangelicalism, yeah. which arguably aren't in the kind of free fall that white evangelicalism is. Uh, what, what is helpful for us to focus on when it comes to race and the evangelical church? Well, we do have to, I, the history is pretty sad. Actually, uh, Mark Knoll has two books on that. He does have a book. Oh, I forget the name of it. It's behind me. I think it's the, oh dear. He's got a book on race and the church, but I just okay. forget the name. But he's we'll, also we'll Google got, it and link to it. Yeah, he's also, if you put in Mark, uh, Mark Knoll, N-O-L-L, -L, and mm -hmm. race, it, there's a book that actually has the word race in the title. So it's kind of a history of of the church and race and our God culture. and race in American politics. That's it. That's the one. Is that it? But, okay. but there's, Great. there's another one that I think in some ways gets to the question of where did this, wh why is it that white evangelicals are so ambivalent about race? Why, why, why do they seem to 
really wink at white supremacy. I mean, they they don't they don't articulate it, but when they hear it, they you know they're they're not put off by it. Uh, and I think that you have to read Mark Knoll's book, uh, "The Civil War as a Theological Crisis." I think that's a fascinating book. In fact, the title is a fascinating thing. Yeah, and he he points out that the rest of the world, um, already had moved on. I mean, for example. <clears throat> Uh, James Thornwell and Robert Dabney, who are two Southern Presbyterians. So I'm going to take, Carrie, I'm going to take responsibility right. here. Yeah. yeah, conservative Presbyterian theologians, Calvinist, you know, very Orthodox. And um, they were absolutely uh, in uh, lockstep theologically with the with conservative uh Presbyterians in Scotland. Uh, the great leader was Thomas Chalmers, and uh, you know the Free Church of Scotland, which which was a really really strong uh, church. And theologically, they were exactly the same. But Thornwell and Dabney were making all these arguments about, well, the Bible justifies race uh, 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 slavery. Slavery is fine. Look, it says slaves obey your masters. And the Free Church people over in Scotland are saying, you're you're kidding, right? You know, I said. Uh, you know, the Bible, look, yeah, look, it says, uh, you know, slavery is something that God in the Mosaic legislation is there. And they look and say, you know, it does say in Deuteronomy that if a slave escapes, you don't return him because it shows they were abused. It says in Exodus that if you hit a slave to punish him and you knock his tooth out, he goes free. It says there that nobody should be a slave more than six years. It says there that slavery is never based on, you know, race. And they say, you're kidding, right? And and yet what had happened was because the economy of the South, certainly the uh, prosperous South, you know, the people who had the money was based on slavery. And there was this enormous pressure uh, on the Christians to justify it and not to undermine it. And you look at somebody like Thornwell and Dabney, because I have read their stuff. And at, at one level, they seem to be extremely sincere and very, very smart. But it's so fascinating that the, the cultural times shaped the way in which they read the Bible. And people who were not in that spot, they could see that they were being distorted. I mean, people from Scotland elsewhere, they could see it. And um, But what happened was they justified it. And then, of course, they had the Civil War and then they lost. And afterwards, there was a lot of uh, white Southern evangelicals that, that held on to this self-justifying approach saying, well, black people... They should be slaves because you know, look, they're they're inferior. Look at look at their poverty. Look at look at the crime, and that just that was a very very powerful moment in American history, where um, the church, the Southern Church, should have turned to the Bible and read it. I think in context with, I mean, read it in connection with other people from other cultures. See, it wasn't that easy to do back then, and said, hey, "Are we reading this right, or are we just?" reading our own needs into it? Are we really listening to God's word or are we kind of eisegeting, you know, reading into it what we want to see? Um, but they failed. They did read it in. And that just, that that has infected. I mean, the, the white evangelicals have always had a strong strain of distrust of other races. And I think I think it comes down from that. And those, those two books by Noel do help us see how that happened. And it's... Um, it, you know, is that our original sin? I don't know. Is that American evangelicals' original sin? I don't know if I go that far. I think we have our own original sin. <laughs> it's, it's not slavery. It's turning from God, and we we all have remaining sin in us. But it's it's been tremendously tragic, and we're still experiencing it now. Yeah. Well, another thing we're really experiencing too is politics, yeah. and I forget whether it was a New York Times or. Uh, Atlantic that you wrote for, but you've had a couple of pieces over the last few years on the uh, close coupling yeah. of conservative evangelicals and the politicization, really, of church. Um, your thoughts on that and where that becomes problematic and perhaps contributing to the decline of American evangelicalism? Well, now that's the if you ask why this in, why did this politicization happen. You know, why is it happening? Um, 
That's the hardest question you've asked me so far, I, I think. In fact, I bet it's the hardest question you're going to ask me. So I mean, you might want to give yourself a cigar right now. Well, thank this you. Is, yeah, you're welcome. This, 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 is, this is hard. So let me give you the best answer I can. Uh, liberal democracy, which is how our... I'm using the word liberal very broadly. Liberal democracy, which is how our constitution was written how our you know how our country was founded was the idea that the government is neutral when it comes to religion and religious beliefs it does not impose religion and religious beliefs on people it doesn't impose a worldview on people it doesn't say uh it, it, it doesn't hook up to catholicism or chris or price you know lutheranism or whatever and therefore, it's big on freedom of association, freedom of speech. It's a pluralistic society, so you have Jews and Catholics and various kinds of Protestants and atheists, and 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 it doesn't impose a worldview or religious views on people, and uh, or moral values on people. And it came out of the Enlightenment because the Enlightenment was born a couple hundred years before. Uh, America in the wars of religion, when everybody was fighting, basically people were dying as to which religion my my country is going to be. And the, a lot of the thinkers of Europe came up and said, hey, you know what? Let's, let's create a society in which there's no one religion that is the official religion. And we are coming together just as reasonable people, and we decide how we want to live together. And uh, we, 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 we park our religion at the door when we come into the public realm and we, we make laws based on, you know, common, common good and that kind of thing. And for a very long time, that worked in America. And I just want you to know that that's the problem. The big problem is that liberal democracy is in crisis. And the reason it's in crisis <clears throat> is because, and here's the irony, and I, I don't think I, I, I think I could trace this out if I was writing something down, I think it'd be a little hard early right now to do it. But weirdly enough, liberal democracy kind of led to the decline of religion, probably. Because it, it really said, you know, religion is okay for your private life, but when it comes to the public life, we really don't need it. You know, it's really not important. We just use science and reason to figure out how we're gonna live, and you, you park your religion at the door when we come out here and talk together, you know, whether you're a Jew or a Catholic or a Muslim or a Christian or an atheist, you, you, you know, you, you come together and we just, we just, un, you know, we just decide this. And it was, it was part of, uh, I think what weakened faith because it was really saying faith is a private thing. It just makes you happy, but it really isn't all that necessary for how you live your whole life. Whatever. But the fact is that when religion started to decline, the thing that now, I, I have some atheist friends who admit this, say the thing that actually held us together was not freedom of speech, freedom of association, you know, using our reason. What held us together was like 80% of the population went to either a Catholic or a, or a Protestant church. They actually went. And that even though, like, you know, the liberals and conservatives in Congress would were uh, arguing over taxes or unions, but they would never argue over same-sex marriage. They all thought it would be a horrible thing. In other words, everybody was a nominal, 80, 90 percent of people were nominal Christians. And because they were nominal Christians, they had, they had a moral base, and they lived with the illusion that we're really not a Christian country, we're a secular country. But the fact is they'd never really had to deal with pluralism using liberal democratic uh, you know, structure. And when real pluralism came along, when real pluralism came along, we found out we, we couldn't abide it. And so now here's the first thing that happened. The first, the first group of people that actually moved away from liberal democracy into we're going to impose our worldview on you were the progressives. They were the first people to start doing it. Um, what uh, Rowan Williams, Archbishop of Canterbury, former, talks about, he calls it programmatic secularism rather than procedural secularism. In other words, it used to be the government was secular in the sense of being a neutral umpire and said, okay, you know, we, we want to make sure everybody has a, a you know level playing field to make your case and, and live your lives. But, but programmatic secularism goes like this. Um, 
uh, if you, ex- well, I'll put it this way. In the 60s and 70s, e- or even the 50s, if somebody wrote a book saying it's okay to be gay, that would probably be not publishable because it would be banned as obscene speech, right? Today, if you say, if you try to write a book or say it's not okay to be gay, now it's also condemned as obscene speech, except it's called hate speech. And what's happened is there was a kind of hegemony, it wasn't pluralistic, there was a kind of nominal Christian hegemony that really did run things. And when when that fell apart, now we realize, well, who's going to get in charge of just defining hate speech and obscene speech? And progressives said, we're going to do it. And so what they actually have done is they are imposing a kind of programmatic, uh, hard secularism. And conservatives and Christians have seen that. They say, you know what, you're not being neutral anymore. You're really actually pushing. You're really, you're actually saying, you're actually saying you have to keep your religion totally, totally private when our religion doesn't allow that. Now, by the way, it's the same problem with Islam. So they're going to have the more Muslims that are here, the more props they're going to have there too. But the issue is that conservatives are pushing back wrongly, I think, and are saying, yeah, liberal democracy doesn't work. We need, there's a lot of conservatives and we need Christian nationalism. We actually need to get that the state needs to be overtly Christian, overtly Protestant, or there needs to be, you know, the Catholic integralists say that the Catholic church should be the state church. And what they're saying is there's absolutely no way to get that moral consensus. We're always going to be fragmented. Liberal democracy doesn't work. And it is a crisis because the fact is, as long as everybody was a nominal Christian, liberal democracy works and it doesn't, we're not that way anymore. Liberal democracy undermined Christianity and religion in general, and created this situation where we truly are divided. And now the old liberal democracy, d- democratic, uh, uh, you know, proceduralism doesn't bring us together. We're just mm-hmm. at each other's throats. We have alternate views of reality, totally different views of reality. And I don't have a good way forward. I mean, if you were asking me that question, I'm not going to answer it because I'm actually thinking it out. I still think liberal democracy is way better than Catholic integralism or Protestant Christian nationalism. But I also feel like you've got to call out the progressives, you know, to say this, what you consider democracy actually isn't. It is actually an imposition of your worldview on us. So I, I feel like we have to call both sides out. But when I do that, I am, maybe Carrie, you know, I am called both sideism, um, you know, playing, you know, ba- or, or, or being trying to be apolitical when you can't be. I, I don't think that's possible. But I do think it's fair to say, sorry, right and left, you're, I don't know what the alternative is, but you, what you are proposing is absolutely wrong, will never really work. So I told you this was the hardest question, and I don't know what you're going to do with So, Tim, that is fascinating. And I guess you could say that for the first time, we really do have a plurality of opinions, right? Like, that's what pluralism is. We have divergent opinions. I also know that, you know, you spent a lot of time in your active ministry navigating LGBTQ issues and the sexuality of the scripture versus our culture's view Um, Just to draw that out a little bit more, I know we've talked about identity and how that's become a defining characteristic of this generation. But how do you suggest, because obviously there are people who are affirming who listen to this podcast, there are people who are not, but how do you suggest when you have a different viewpoint than perhaps the culture does, how do you express that in a way that isn't reactionary or angry or inflammatory or completely alienating from the gospel? Well, you've half answered. I love questions where you... The question actually gives half the answer. That was a softball, was it? <laughs> it was. I mean, I, a lot of it has to do with tone. A lot of it has to do with also. Uh, it, it, another thing, it, a lot of it has to do with um, the theater that you're in when you're talking. In other words, are you, are you just spouting the world? Or are you actually talking to somebody face-to-face? Are you talking to neighbors? Um, are you... Uh, I think... What you have to do is you have to say, here's how I see it. Um, But then the the best way to do this is to say, my understanding of your point of view is this. 
And then when you are done, if the other person says that you said that perfectly well, I couldn't have said it better myself, then you can say, well, here's why I don't agree with it. And here's, here's my point of view. I think that in that way, you, you actually have, um, it's face-to-face. You know, you have people who are talking to each other. I actually, by the way, believe that that cadre of people, they do have to spend time together before they would make those videos. They actually have to have these, a lot of these conversations before they make the videos. But I do think you might be able to do something like that, where, where you are giving people um, examples of how we ought to be talking to each other and, and how we can still live together. So that's the reason why I still believe that liberal democracy, uh, a, a, plur- a truly pluralistic society in which the progressives are not actually shutting out uh, religious people, you know, Orthodox Muslims and, and Christians and uh, Jews who have particular views. But at the same time, there's not some Christian hegemony, some Christian nationalism that's shutting out secular voices or gay voices or anything like that. I don't know how we're not going to have... Um, uh, pluralistic society, how, how we're going to get a pluralistic society unless we change public opinion, which right now is actually trending on both sides away from freedom of speech. It's trending away from these, this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And that is, especially under younger people, you know, uh, you, you, both, le- both left and right, younger people are not in favor of what, what us older people would have considered free speech. They are, they are definitely mm-hmm. in, in, they, they like speech codes. They like just telling people you can't say those things on both sides. And so what you'd have to do is give people examples. And I think that could be done. I think, on the other hand, I don't know, Carrie, once you come up with your uh, list of 10, I actually do know a few, frankly. Uh, I'm on a Zoom call fairly often with um, people on both sides, you know, both religious believers and non-religious people and liberals and more conservative people and all that that actually get together in order to have conversations like this. Um, but it's very, very private and, and very, very informal. But if you were going to do something like this, it's probably, it might be possible. It'd be very interesting. 